Hey guys, my name is Phil and I'm the host of The Phil Experience and I'm very excited to bring you today's episode. As a matter of fact, today's episode is one of the reasons why I changed the name of this podcast from the Moto Beamer Show to The Phil Experience. Ultimately, this experience is rooted in motorcycles, but I needed the opportunity to be able to expand my horizons, to not deny you all the chance to hear from super interesting people, competent people, people with stories and perspectives to share outside of motorcycling. Today's guest is a very special one, one of those competent and interesting people that I just referenced, Colonel Brandon Tackett. So if you don't know the United States Army, a colonel is the rank you have just before you achieve or are promoted to general. So quite the accomplishment and quite the career. You know, I really wasn't quite sure where our conversation would go, but it went some very interesting places for almost three hours. His perspective on things is just absolutely intellectual and incredible. I found myself at a loss sometimes trying to keep up with it. In today's conversation, you're going to hear us start off talking about bourbon, which is actually quite good. And then we get into men's health, resiliency, the need for adversity. We talk about the military. We talk about jujitsu. We talk about corporate America, much to my chagrin. We talk about PTSD, his experiences in combat, and many other things that are just simply quite interesting to listen to. So please enjoy this conversation with my good friend, and I would consider sometimes even a mentor, Ladies and gentlemen, Colonel Brandon Tackett. Sip a bourbon for good luck. Yeah. <coughs> All right. Test, test, test. Recording. Recording, recording. Well, you ready to do it? Absolutely. Cheers. Cheers. Salud. <laughs> Tell me what you think. Now you put the water in. Through the nose, right? While you drink, though. So. Wait, wait. I know. It's like, I know. <laughs> Show me. <laughs> Watch. Mm. A little different, right? Yeah. Uh, That's the, the douchey bourbon taster <laughs> way to do it. <laughs> did you learn that at the bourbon trail? <laughs> I did. I did. I did. Yeah. Well, you, you missed a good time when we did that. When Justin came down. Yeah. That nah, was fun. That was fun. Yeah. So <clears throat> might as well start with that shit. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the bourbon trail, I've never done it. You go mm-hmm. down to, so let me just back up. I watched this documentary you may or may not have seen. It's called Bourbon Tucky. So they go through <clears throat> all the distilleries and they kind of give you, it's obviously not as good mm-hmm. as being there in person, but mm-hmm. other than like just going down there and getting fucked up, like what's the education mm-hmm. like? What? I'll be honest with you. I think it's really just about going down there and getting fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so uh, there's a lot of things that, uh, are cool like a bourbon trail. I think anytime you learn about something, mm. you become more emotionally attached to it. Um, you know, it's, uh, yeah, I, I don't have a good example, like the pizza place that's from your hometown, right? You, you're kind of always emotionally attracted to that. So it, it's a business model where they teach you, they pseudo teach you about bourbon. Right. You learn a little bit, but you're also kind of a tourist and it's a tourist industry. The real fun part is is just having your boys down there and and it's like sanctioned midlife drinking. Mm. That's I think that's what it's about. And, and, and the truth is, is, is there are different levels to bourbon, but I always, you know, I think there's a the marginal difference between the worst bourbon and the best bourbon is pretty small. Um, but uh, you know, you learn a little bit about it. And uh, I mean, what we did is we did an Airbnb, <clears throat> and uh, then we got a party bus. It, it wasn't really a party bus. It's like a, it was like a party van kind of. Uh, but like you could, you know, bring your own music. You could, you could drink, um, and uh, and they kind of the, you you get in at zero eight, and you start drinking right then. And then they take you an hour drive to the first one, and that's fun. And then you go to the second one, and by the third one, I mean, it, yeah, it's yeah. like you're back in college a little bit. So. By noon, it's it's over. Then they take you to dinner, or they <laughs> or they take you to lunch, right? right? So okay. you do a lunch, and then you kind of, you know, you uh, you kind of recuperate a little bit, and then you go to the next one. And by five o'clock, everyone's done. And you know, you're all in your thirties and forties anyway. Yeah, so yeah. five o'clock, you go to dinner, everyone's at bed by eight o'clock, and you get up and do it again. Now, the bourbon trail, I think when you think about it in your mind, you think you can almost walk, but it's it's like an hour in between each one. So mm. you, you really have to do the coordination and and uh, rent like a party bus is what I would recommend. Split it with your friends. And then the guy is kind of a pseudo tour guide as well. And he's walking you through the process. It's it's good. And and then you will learn enough to get emotionally attached to certain bourbons so that then you kind of become brand loyal. And then you learn how to teach people how to mm. drink properly. <laughs> <laughs> what, uh, I don't even remember when this whole 
bourbon explosion happened. So mm. I take it back like I was a big yeah. rum and coke guy. Yeah. And then I was, uh, let's see, I got into tequila for a while. And then yeah. uh, I remember just thinking anything dark, I don't want to drink it. Yeah, and I so we're in the same age, and so um, so yeah, when we were coming up through high school and college, bourbon wasn't really the thing, and I, I guess that bourbon was extremely popular. And I don't know the year twenties, thirties, forties, fifties. It may have been no, actually, I think bourbon was popular till, through the seventies, hmm. and then they switched to to clear liquors because they associated with high calories. And so a lot of the bourbon establishments, you know, died out. Um, and uh, in, in the 90s and 80s, there wasn't much there. But sometime in the early 2000s, it started to pick back up. Um, and, and really, if you think about it, bourbon's kind of the American liquor. It's the, you know, there's only a few things that are truly American, right? Barbecue is one of them. Jazz is one of them. Bourbon is one of them. Mm. And so, it, it, and it's really, really gotten big. I think COVID even pushed it over the edge. And uh, um, so, yeah, I can remember absolutely in college, like Bert, you know, Jack Daniels, right? It was like Jack and Coke, right? <laughs> right, so, right. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> That's so interesting. I mean, now guys are standing in line. Matter of fact, we were just at the liquor store and uh, there's a bottle of E.H. Taylor on the shelf. And you were like, <laughs> first of all, you you picked it up, which I, you know, you're like, I had to do it. But yeah. we were talking about it's only marginally better versus the price point. Yeah. You know, yeah. from a $30 yeah. bottle to a hundred to a thousand dollar bottle. Yeah. I, I think the, uh, I think the specifically Buffalo Trace, I think they, have mastered the scarcity game. Mm. So, you know, they understand that if they make something not available, its value increases. And so, you know, as I was saying earlier, I love E.H. Taylor. It's only a little better than Eagle Rare, you know. Mm. Uh, Eagle Rare is 30 bucks. Uh, you know, Buffalo Trace is $25. Is the difference, would I pay $100 today? So yeah. so is the, is the difference $70? Absolutely not. But the scarcity, right, because it's scarce, it's low supplied. It, it automatically increases demand, and it, it's almost like the the diamond model, you know, that the right. uh, that the diamond dealers do. You know, the truth is, is there's so much diamond in the world that it should be like five dollars a diamond or whatever, mm. whatever it is. Uh, but they do a good job with that, I think. So, and I, I was a sucker today. So, <laughs> cheers to Buffalo Trace, you got me. <laughs> you got. Him. Yeah, it's interesting because you know. Uh, I remember thinking about wine snobs and all this stuff. And now you've got basically bourbon snobs, right? <laughs> guys that will talk the game and all. It's like, look, man, I just want to try it as good. I was recently interviewing uh, Eric Hatterscheidt from uh, Fresh Line Moto Club. And uh, we talked a little bit about what they do. And they, they try to make men stronger, uh, better leaders, and they put them through adversity. And because they go on these expeditions in the third world countries. And I mean, quite frankly, you know, sometimes things get a little sketchy and they want to make sure they can depend on things. And But we did get in this conversation of like primal Mm -hmm. And like what men need and in their lives. And, you know, this kind of ties in a little bit with the bourbon. And you think about the middle aged suburban guy that has a bourbon collection that, you know, maybe works out every now and then or whatever. I'm not trying to shit on anybody, mm -hmm. but that primal, like you're not packing your spears and going out mm -hmm. to hunt something. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think you have an absolutely great perspective on that. I mean, we've talked about it over the years. Mm -hmm. Um, how do we get that back? Or is that even possible? Or are we too far gone? So I, I think that, man, that's tough. I, I think that the way that we're going is the only way to do it. And what I mean by that is, is you know, you see like the rise in popularity of someone like Joe Rogan, or you see the rise in popularity of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu or CrossFit, right? Yeah. Or anything that's hard. And, and I think that we're trying to fill a, a gap in our life, uh, that, that adversity gap, mm. um, you know, adversity is so important. And, uh, you know, I was just reading a quote today. I forgot who said it. Aristotle's from the Greeks, but, uh, you know, you, we, men are both, uh, the sculptor and the block, mm. which means, you know, you can build yourself, but it's going to be painful to do that. And I feel like, uh, since, I don't know, probably World War II ish, right. We've been victims of our own success and life has gotten too comfortable and, uh, and once you lose that adversity, I, I really think you lose a key part of what it is to, to be a man or, or at least to fulfill your potential as a man. And, and I don't think it applies to just men, uh, but, but, but I, think it's, um, I, I, I think it's more prominent in men. Uh, but, uh, you know, so what you're seeing with these things of, of, you know, people doing these boot camps and doing stuff like that, I, I think they're filling a, a huge gap in their life. You know, trauma is a good thing. Um, hmm. uh, it's an, it's not a good thing. It's a necessary thing, right? It's almost like the redwoods, they need fire for the, for the seeds to be able to grow. Uh, I think a man is the same way. And so I, I, I think that, I, I hope that it doesn't go away. And hmm. I hope that we understand that we're going to have to 
present ourselves with artificial adversity um, or at a minimum discipline to build ourselves to reach our full potential. And I think that's what you're seeing. So Eric mentioned something that uh, he framed up in a way, you know, a lot of times we'll use a trait or people will use a trait, toxic masculinity. <clears throat> and he's like, you know, it's, it's not toxic if it's channeled in the right method. And he kind of mm -hmm. tied that to basically trying to tear men down in a way. And I'm not speaking for mm -hmm. him, just kind of mm -hmm. what I inferred from the, mm -hmm. from the, uh, the conversation. So a lot of the things that we do, uh, there's a quote and I'll paraphrase Jordan Peterson was, uh, he was talking about, you know, men should be capable of violence. Mm -hmm. Maybe not, you're out, you're not out there trying to fight people, but you should mm -hmm. be capable of violence, right? Yeah. yeah, that's funny. Uh, the idea of toxic masculinity is interesting to me. Um, I think I think there's toxic masculinity, there's toxic femininity, there's toxic anything human, right? Yeah. Um, it's really about balance. And and the 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 and what was the quote from Peter saying again? Uh, that men should be capable. Yes. I don't know if he said yeah. extreme yeah. violence, but he said men should yeah, be capable yeah, of violence. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think his idea there is that. Um, that you should be somewhat dangerous um, because if you're not dangerous, then you're not showing restraint, right? And hmm. uh, right, uh, it's something to, to that effect. And so, I, I think I, I absolutely agree with him. You absolutely should be capable of violence. Um, you got to have a balance. You got to have a balance. And so, you know, the, you used to have this idea of the Renaissance man, right? Yeah. The Renaissance man was I'm both articulate and smart and logical, but I'm also physical and rough, and, right? And that that we kind of lost that for a few generations there. That idea that you have to build your body as much as you have to build your mind. Um, and building your mind academically is one thing, but building your body takes discipline. And that's like the other side of the equation. And so it goes back to balance. And so toxic masculinity, I, um, you know, I've heard, it, uh, I've heard it put once that you either embrace your toxic uh, masculinity or you embrace another country's toxic masculinity, right? Oh, yeah. Those are your two choices. And so, um, you know, so I, I think it's, it's important for society to balance out, um, extreme masculine acts so that it doesn't become toxic. Um, but, but you have to still have that kind of adversity, right? You have to have that ability to, to do violence if you have to. Um, if, if you are not capable of violence and you never do violence, it's not, it's not a virtue. But if you're capable of violence and you never do violence, then it's a virtue, right? Mm. Um, and I think that's kind of what Peterson was talking about. <clears throat> well, I, we're going to get to it earlier than I had planned. Not that I would planned this, but I think that leads into, you know, what you are very well accomplished at Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, right? Second degree, black belt, <laughs> under... Uh, Jim Kelly and Pedro Sauer. Jim Kelly and Pedro Sauer. So you talk about being capable of violence, mm -hmm. almost extreme violence. And uh, I've never seen a more calm person than a very well-trained Brazilian jiu-jitsu artist. Mm. I think it's because maybe you can uh, add some insight to this because there is a virtue there of uh, I'm not walking around puffing my chest out like I got to fight somebody. Mm -hmm. And I think that the the experience of jiu-jitsu and being humbled constantly and having to shelve your ego and knowing that there's always more you can learn is is very valuable. So um, you've been doing it for how long now? Oh, man, 20, um, what is it, 24? Uh, so 20, 24, 25 years? 25 years, yeah. and I would guess that you probably haven't figured it all out. No, 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 no. It's a, it's a mountain that the higher you, you climb, the higher the mountain gets. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah. yeah, I call it, a, it's a, it's like an inverse pyramid is what it is. But uh, yeah, you know, I, I think that um, a couple things. So I, I think that with the rise of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, um, I think it's good for society. Uh, mm. and, and, and really, I've never seen anything grow like I've seen Jiu Jitsu grow. I mean, I, you know, you, if you look at like Judo and the in the fifties and Taekwondo in the seventies and eighties, I don't think anything's grown like Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. And I think it's because Brazilian Jiu Jitsu fulfills a niche that, that people are missing. And, and, and the beautiful thing about Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is that it's, it can be dangerous, but it's not right. It's called the gentle art, right? That's, right. that's what Jiu Jitsu translates into. And so it's this idea that, um, I can put you in a, a simulated life threatening situation and let you compete almost as if you're fighting for your life. But in the end, no one's going to get hurt, right? So it's almost like bowling with with bumper, um, you know, bumper lanes, right. kind of in a way. So you get to kind of check the block and 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 fill that that primal competition that maybe you don't you don't get to fill uh, in any other aspect of your life, right? Maybe you play club soccer or you play some softball, but it's not as um, it's not as in your face violent as something like Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is. And so I think that's that's what it is. Um, that I think that's the niche that it's fulfilling. Um, it's 
kind of consequence free violence. Hmm. Um, and then to your point of, about the jujitsu guys being extremely um, kind of calm, I, I actually don't think it's tied to their capability for violence as much as it is that they are actively training and the act of training and building yourself is, is what makes you calm. It's not the mm. capability to do violence. I think people get those two mixed yeah. up sometimes. And so, you know, you'll hear people say things like, to, even to me, like, oh, what's it like to be so so tough or so able to be able to overcome someone in a physical, uh, uh, you know, confrontation? The truth is, is anyone can pull out a gun at any time and anyone could get knocked out at any time. So even yeah. though I'm, I'm really, I'm pretty good at jujitsu, you know, I could still get sucker punched. Someone could still stab me. Someone, you know, so I'm, I'm almost as that threat as, as, as the normal um, uh, population. The difference is, is because I, I train so much, I've well-rounded myself to where it's almost like a mental release. And I think that's where the balance comes from, is, is that I have an outlet. It's almost like, you know, young boys, you know, force them to sit in classrooms for eight hours a day and they're going crazy and they want to, like, give, you know, say they have ADHD and all that stuff. But in reality, they just need to move more and be physical. Mm. I, I think that Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu kind of checks a similar block for, for adults. You know, we talked about that in my other show about you know uh, men chasing escapism through lots of other means. And I think that the jujitsu release, that's a really great way to put it. And I noticed you referenced jujitsu in terms of a lot of self-defense. Somebody's going to pull out a gun. Somebody's going to mm -hmm. pull out a knife. What are your thoughts on, I mean, because there are schools that I'm sure you've been to, I've been to, that they really don't emphasize the uh, self-defense aspect. You know, mm -hmm. we always start mm -hmm. sitting on our butts or, you know, yeah, not that there's not yeah. some dangerous dudes out there, but yeah. I know that you're big into Gracie combatives and yeah, you yeah. teach that. What are your thoughts? So, on that? so it's it's two it's it's there's two sides to that. So uh, I, I think that the addiction of jujitsu comes from the flow, um, mm. and 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 I think I've mentioned this to you before. If you want to like compare it to drugs or something, right? Like when you first go to a jujitsu school, you're a, you're you're the drug that you're you're chasing is the kind of, I want to be tougher. I don't want to have anxiety. I want to be able to physically dominate someone. Mm. And that's what brings people in a lot, but that's like your first beer, right? Yeah. Um, it's, it's entry, it's your entry drug, right? And then as you've trained for a few years and you become like a, a, a blue belt or purple belt, um, you start to get better and you start to physically dominate people. Um, and now you've kind of moved on to like maybe cocaine or something like that. Right. And, and it's, and it's a rush and it's fun and it's, you're almost in it for the athletic aspect of it. Um, but like the true addiction starts when you're like a brown belt and black belt. And that's when you discover flow, right. And flow is mm. a very hard thing to find in life. And I've always, I've often compared it to things like snowboarding and stuff like that. But it's, it's when you are solving a challenging problem that you are capable of solving with a physical aspect to it where you get to be completely present, but also detach, right? And it's this weird, unique thing. And, and, and once you get really good at jujitsu, you start to learn how to flow with people. Um, and once you learn how to flow, that's, you're not, you're no longer in it for the, even the self-defense aspects of it, or even the I'm um, tougher than you or the domination aspect of it. It doesn't matter. Someone could even be dominating you, but it, but it's that mental sweet spot of just flowing and all the problems that you came in with that day are, are no longer there because you're present in the moment, but you're also detached and your body is just on automatic. Right. Mm. And, and I, I find it's especially um, easy to get to, <clears throat> whenever you're sparring with someone just a little below your level, right? So like I don't flow whenever I go with other black belts. It's more like competition. Yeah. But you give me a purple belt or a brown belt. So he's challenging me, but not, but, but, but I'm, cap I'm capable of overcoming it. Then I can get into the flow state, right? And so if you look at jujitsu from a flow perspective, um, then I understand the schools where it's pure kind of just let's roll, let's not do self-defense, you know what I mean? We mm -hmm. don't have to do punch block defense. We'll just start on our butts because they're really just in it for the flow. So I absolutely get that. So that's the first side of the coin. The other side of the coin is it is the utilitarian aspect of jujitsu is it is a self-defense, right? And so it would be like being really good at snowboarding without the snow, right? I mean, right. you know what I mean? And so like you could probably skate down a, a dry mountain and use the same skills that you use in snowboarding a little bit, right? It's probably a bad analogy, but... Um, but there's still, there's a utilitarian aspect of jujitsu that, that, um, that it is self-defense and, and you want to be really good at a, f a street fight, right? Because 
it doesn't do you any good if you're a black belt and you just roll in the flow, but you know, someone attacks you in a Walmart parking lot and you freeze because you, you're not used to someone throwing punches at you. Right. Mm. And so I think that, that it's best to maximize both. Right. So the thing that brings me in the gym is the flow, but the utilitarian aspect of it, of knowing how to handle someone throwing punches at me, knowing, understanding that, um, you know, you're not always going to roll in an artificial flat mat environment, that there's going to be, uh, there's going to be couches and cars and curbs and other things like that. Right. Understanding that, um, is, is key. And, and, and I really like the, uh, I think the Spartans have a quote, um, uh, is, is their quote goes something like this. You fight out of habit, um, not out of emotion. Right. Mm. And so you can learn how to flow almost in a street fight situation by, by doing the basics of the old school jujitsu. Right. It's not as fun, right. We're not going to do a continuous roll right, for a minute, you know, for 10 minutes at a time and then switch partners. Um, but you can get really good at maintaining distance at closing, closing the distance at, at achieving a clinch at achieving a takedown at holding someone until help gets there or, okay, now there's not help that's coming. So I'm going to have to finish this person myself. You can turn that into a flow if you do it enough. And so, you know, I, I always say you don't want the first time to be your first time. And so also being in the military, um, you know, whenever I'm teaching, I'm, I'm the Ohio Army National Guard combatants coach. And so, you know, we, we start with punches, right? And so mm. if you, you know, if you can't do jujitsu with someone throwing punches at you, is it really jujitsu? You know what I mean? And so, um, you know, that, that, that's, yeah, so I think that's important. So I think to answer your question, I think you should do both, right? You yeah. should, you should, the flow is what's going to keep you coming back. The flow is going to give you the most benefit psychologically and in your life. However, the utilitarian aspect of, of the martial art um, is key, and you have to have that as well. L long answer. No, it's good. I, and uh, you always told me jujitsu is like an escalator, right? I think that's the perfect mm -hmm. way to describe it. Everybody's path is different. Everybody's speed is different. Um, but what's the difference between a black belt and a white belt? And black belt didn't stop coming. Right, right. Um, you, you mentioned Army, the Army combatives team that mm -hmm. you coach. What is that like? So. I frame this question up in the fact that uh, I think I went to Modern Army Combatives in like 2006, mm -hmm. and they had levels and everything. Has there been more of jujitsu incorporated mm -hmm. into that? So Modern Army Combatives, I would say its foundation was Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. So Matt okay. Larson, uh, uh, Matt Larson was the first guy to really train with the Gracies. Um, this is like UFC one, UFC two, UFC three, right back mm -hmm. when Hoist Gracie was, was was you know was almost otherworldly, right? Um, and so, uh, you know, so the army invest, I think the Ranger bat, I'm not sure you could, you, know, you could check this, but I think it was a Ranger bat that, that sent Matt Larson out and, and he trained with them. And I think when he wrote the modern army combatives manual, he was only like a purple belt, right? Which is mm. kind of comical now, right? right. You know? Uh, but it just shows how little we, we knew. And, and Matt, Matt's still a very prominent figure in the combatives community, but I would say the Mo modern army combatives program was, was exclusively based off of, uh, Gracie Jiu Jitsu specifically. Um, and, uh, you know, what, what's funny is that, uh, not to get sidetracked, but, uh, I was enlisted in the Marine Corps before I came to the army and, and we learned, uh, something called line training. Hmm. And so I, I think an, an interesting book or research paper would, would be to go through kind of the U S history of hand to hand combat right. and kind of see how it's changed from, you know, the civil war. Really, I would love to learn about the revolutionary war, what they were doing then. I know it was really bayonet based, but right, the Civil War, World War One, World War Two, and then somehow we ended up in like this form of hand to hand combat that just wasn't very effective. Uh, you know, it, you know, it, some knife disarmament stuff, you know, but it was kind of kung fu karate based, um, right. which isn't terrible. I think you need some ballistic skills, uh, but like there was no grappling. And, and when I came in in '96, there was no grappling at all. And, 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 uh, and at that point we had already seen UFC and I was already, I was wrestling in college at the time. So I, I kind of knew that like, yeah, if you try this team, I'm just going to hit a double leg on you and sit on your chest and punch you in the face. Right. right so, right. so it, it was almost like we were all, uh, like playing along with a game, a make believe game that mm. like, oh yeah, this would definitely work in combat, but of course it wasn't going to work. You know, right. you were going to get your ass kicked is what was going to happen. Mm. And I think what's funny is if you look at what the Russians were doing with Sambo, those guys had it right, you know, and, and good thing we didn't get in a hand to hand, uh, mm. you know, combat with the Russians in the seventies or eighties. Cause I think they would have cleaned us out hand to hand. Of course it probably wouldn't have made it to hand to hand, but like their form of martial arts was a combination of wrestling judo, uh, you know, with, with other striking martial arts, it was spot on. It was basically MMA. Um, and, uh, so I think when Matt Larson, um, you know, introduced the army to combat, uh, to jujitsu, I think it's changed the way the DOD views, uh, you know, uh, self-defense. Now, now you can look at the Marine Corps, uh, you can look at all the services They're They're somewhat, the Marine Corps is really more MMA focused, but they're, they're still basically jujitsu focused. And so, 
Um, so I'm really happy to, to see that now. Um, now the Army Combatives program. So uh, I, I coach the Ohio team, and uh, we go to the All Army Combatives uh, tournament, which is pretty cool. I think we're the only National Guard um, state that, that does that. Uh, but it's it's an interesting com- you know competition. You get you know there's 20 or 30 teams. All the major divisions send a team there. Uh, you start off with the 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 first round is basic, which is kind of like jujitsu, but you're wearing your OCPs, your mm-hmm. your basic military fatigue style uniform. And it's just grappling, right? It's a five-minute match, and it, you score points. So it's just like you'd see in any jiu-jitsu tournament. <clears throat> Excuse me. Then when you go to um, round two, they do pancration, which is really interesting to me that we call it pancration, but it's pancration rules, which is, which is based off of the pancration martial art from the Greeks uh-huh. from the original Olympics, right? And so it's really cool. It's open hand strikes, kicks with grappling, 10 minute match and it's judged through the whole fight. So there's no points. Mm -hmm. And then the final, uh, the advanced rules are straight up MMA. So they're wearing, uh, OCP pants. They have shin pads on and UFC uh, gloves. And it is a, and it's in a cage in downtown Columbus, Georgia, and it's a straight up fight. And so, uh, so I I think if you, if you were to look at where, uh, army combatives or self-defense is now, it's heads and shoulders above anything we've ever done uh, going back, you know, since the 1770s. You know, you are a, and you said something, and I, I don't want to deter too far away from combatives and jujitsu, but you said something, and you're a student of history, been to war college. Uh, we were just talking about history before we started talking mm-hmm. here, uh, and you talked about, you know, how things were in the Revolutionary War and Civil mm-hmm. War. Uh, a long time ago, have you, you've read the book uh, On Killing? Lieutenant Colonel, Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman. I did not read that one. Okay. No. <laughs> um, he mentioned something in the book about, you know, could you mention bayonets mm-hmm. and how guys would avoid using bayonets on other people because they didn't want to be bayoneted yeah. or how they would find dead guys with two or three musket balls lodged inside their musket because they didn't mm-hmm. want to shoot anybody or they would intentionally miss. Mm-hmm. And I found that uh, fascinating in warfare that even in those – very close quarters conditions, people would still avoid, or soldiers would still avoid trying to kill the other side, yeah. for lack of a better term. Yeah. What was your main focus in that, in, in the, at the War College? Did yeah. you say a lot of that? Or? Yeah, so War College is interesting. Um, uh, yeah, I really enjoyed it, man. I, I did the, the distance learning, so it was like 26, 27 months. There's a lot of work. Um, mm. And I, I really enjoyed it because I would say it's a perfect marriage of uh, strategy and history. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and so we didn't go that far back. I mean, we did. We went, so you're, I think the furthest we went back was the Peloponnesian war. We also did a lot of Sun Tzu, which, which technically Sun Tzu, I think is, is before the Peloponnesian war. Um, right. They were, that was kind of when, when, when China was coming up initially. Um, but that's probably as far back as we went. Yeah. And, and I tell you the Pel- Peloponnesian war, if you haven't studied that, like, wow, like <laughs> it is fascinating it is it is russia and america right it is you know there's something called the thucydides trap uh, uh that uh, that the peloponnes the best work on the peloponnesian war i think is was written by thucydides and uh and and it's this idea of of you have a dominant superpower mm. and then you have an up and coming superpower, and there's almost always a war between the two, and they call that the the Thucydides trap. Right? And, and a perfect example right now is us and China, right? China yeah. kind of, yeah, they kind of came out of nowhere um, in a, in the '90s, 2000s, and really in the last 20 years. And so that's that Thucydides trap because someone's in charge, you got a champion, and now you got a number one contender, right? Mm. Uh, and so uh, so we went deep on that, and uh, you know if you want to, and that was Sparta and the and Athens, right? Other Good lessons from that is is the um, kind of the the threat of uh, having a lot of uh, allies, right? Because if you look at all the, the really big nasty wars, uh, were usually tied uh, through extreme, extremely large ally networks, right? Mm. And that's then that and that's how these things kick off. And you can look at China and America, and you have Taiwan, right? And we're allies with Taiwan, and so if it's going to kick off between China and us, well, where's it going to kick off through an ally? Right. right, and same same deal with uh, with Sparta and and uh, um, and Athens, and so lots of lessons there. That's probably about as far back as as, as, as we mm. went. And so um, <clears throat> when you look at the idea of not being willing to kill or engage, I think it's absolutely normal. I really do. Mm. Um, I don't think that we're hardwired um, necessarily to to want to brutally kill each other. I think we're hardwired to fight. Right, but I don't think we're hardwired to kill each other. 
right? And, uh, you know, you know, if you look in the animal kingdom, right, tigers and lions, they have these killing weapons, right? And they're going to yeah. kill each other. If you look at the apes, they don't really have killing weapons, right? They pummel each other to death. And they can kill each other, and chimpanzees have been known to kill each other. But if, like, if you watch, you know, two silverbacks from separate groups go at it, it's like a 30-second bar fight, and then mm. one of them kind of gets the better. And then the idea is to survive, right? And so who's dominant? Okay, you're dominant but we each survived. So the idea of, of uh, you know, a human with a killing machine in their hand with another person in their sights not willing to, wanting to pull the trigger, to me, is normal. Yeah, I, I get that. I, I absolutely understand that. Now, you can logically work your way out of that because if you don't kill that person, they're probably going to kill you. But the, the initial idea of not wanting to pull the trigger, yeah, I, I'd say that's, that's, that probably happens more than, than it's even reported. <clears throat> And then we get to watch movies like Band of Brothers and Saving Private Ryan. And I won't say we're, uh, war is not glorified in those. I think they're very, well, I wasn't there, but they're pretty accurately depicted. Yeah. yeah. And, and to your point, if I don't kill that guy, he's going to kill me. Yeah. And then you put these soldiers and, you know, uh, soldiers, Marines, whatever, in, the, mm -hmm. in that position of like, well, I got to do this. And then you do it for years, uh, like my grandfather did, like we talked about. Mm -hmm. And then, Man, we're going off on a tangent here, but then you got to come back and uh, integrate back in society. Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. uh, our generation, a uh, couple decades of war, really struggles with that. Really tough. Really, really tough. Really yeah. tough. Uh, PTSD and all the things. Uh, worked with a couple organizations that uh, sponsor uh, motorcycle rides for veterans with PTSD and, and other types of things. But I think uh, you can go one of two ways, and mm -hmm. uh, not to generalize it, but. You can either get back and, and realize that I had to deal with these things or you can go down the route of extreme depression, PTSD. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, I think um, there are some challenges there Yeah, with our generation <clears throat> that, that uh, you know, had to come back and deal with that stuff. Yeah, you know, um, kind of going back to the idea of – so PTSD is, is complex. Um, I think it's a processing problem more than anything else, right? Mm. Um, I, uh, there's, there's two things. There's one thing on the front end and that modern war is extremely violent. And it's, it's almost supernatural. Um, I, I, like, like the, you know, I've, I've been blown up with a mortar round. I got hit with an 81 millimeter mortar round in Iraq. Um, and it was about from here to that corner, right? Which is, a, you can't see it on the camera, but yeah. it's about, you know, 12 feet away. Mm. So I had an 81 millimeter mortar round land about 12 feet from me. I was standing sideways. So I have about eight pieces of shrapnel on my left side. Uh, and, and a soldier, uh, a specialist lamb was standing right to my right. We were almost like, like a T like this. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, and I got hit with small pieces of shrapnel. He got hit with a huge piece of shrapnel. Right. And I kind of, I fell over on top of him. Uh, and unfortunately he didn't survive the blast. Um, but the supernatural aspect of it was, it, like if you've ever, you ever you've been around explosions, right? Mm -hmm. Have you? And I've, mm -hmm. I've been hit with a couple IDs as well. But like, it's such a supernatural um, th experience uh, to be that close to a huge bomb, right? I mean, mm -hmm. I remember when we were going in Fallujah, we were, we were delivering uh, ammunition to their uh, field artilleries, uh, field artillery units to the Marines, and like I, we saw the fast movers come in, right? Airstrikes, and like there's, it is hard to describe to someone that has not seen a bomb explode, you know, within you know, let's say. I don't know, half a mile or something like that. A mortar round b blowing up right beside you is such a shock to the system. There's nothing like it uh, in the animal world, right? Mm. It's the only thing I could compare it to would be like a head on collision that you didn't see coming, you know, mm -hmm. going like 45 miles an hour. It's just like we're, we didn't evolve, right? Having things like that. The closest thing you had was a meteor hitting, right? Or something. There's just, it's just not, not normal. Yeah. So I, I think that that can imprint on you, right? If you get blown up, um, right. Uh, or if you get shot with a 50 cow or, right, or something happens, I think that that can have a serious psychological impact or imprint on you. And, and I think that can cause some problems that maybe even, you know, say the Spartans, right. Or, or someone that did, you know, or the Romans, right. The Roman legions that were, were doing like face to face, you know, killing, um, I think that that can have a psychological imprint that even, you know, you know, stabbing someone with a sword uh, probably wouldn't have. But by the same token, I think that stabbing someone with a sword is way more personal than shooting someone at distance, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of hard to tell. Uh, like, is today's generation, are, are we more impacted because of the type of weapons we're using um, or not? Uh, that's a good question. However, I definitely know it's a, uh, on the back end is it's a processing problem, right? And what do I mean by that? Um, so, uh, you know, if you were uh, the average Roman legionnaire, 
and, and you did a gruesome campaign. Uh, when you came back to your society, society was still pretty raw. They, they understood that, that, that you were defending them, right? Mm-hmm. And they weren't detached from the conflict, right? Because it was usually happening 40 miles away, right? And if you don't stop the Gothic hordes, then they're going to come in and rape and kill everyone, right? right? And so the entire society, it was almost like when Ohio State plays Michigan, right? The entire city of Columbus is is behind the team of, of you know, the Ohio State, right? Um, it's, you know, when you did war back in the day, um, you were defending, you know, your children, right? And so you had this amazing sense of purpose, um, the family and children that you were defending knew that you were defending that, and they were 100% bought in. So when you came home, I think the reception was different, and, uh, and, and everyone was a participant in that conflict. I think in today's war, specifically with the U.S., because our power projection is so amazing and our logistics is so amazing, that we can effectively run a war, and the homeland has no concept that mm. there's really even a war going on. And I, I got to think that's probably the first time in history that's happened. And so what happens is, you know, when, when Billy, who joined the Marines, comes back, um, they just drop him right back in the society, you know? And, mm. and you especially see this in the reserve components. I think it's a bigger problem in the reserve components than even the active duty. Because in the active duty, you typically come back to a total institution. You come back to Fort Carson. You come back to Fort Bragg. And, and you're still plugged in. Everyone's still wearing the uniform, right? right? And so yeah. that's a different dropping off in the society. The reserve component, which we have higher rates of PTSD in the reserve components when we do the uh, Compo 1 active duty, um, they just drop you off back in Bailey, Colorado, right? And, yeah. and where, where, where no one even acknowledges that there's a war going on. And, 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 and so you are ostracized, not by society, but almost by yourself, right? Uh, it's almost a self-ostracization that happens. I don't know if that's a word, but it should be, um, right? And, and, and so I, I think that that means that you're not processing what happened, right? The Spartans, after they would have a large battle, would actually have crying sessions where they would drink and, and all cry together the night or the day after the battle, right? Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and when you went back to your village, you were celebrated and there were there were feasts thrown. And and not that our society doesn't celebrate us, but, it, but it's not as tangible right. as, as it was then. So I, I would argue that it's, tr- it's truly a, a processing problem. And, and I think a great example of that is World War II, although World War II had... Uh, you know, pretty large uh, rate of PTSD too, not nearly what we see now because the entire country was bought in, right? Because, Mm. you know, we were attacked and if we didn't win World War II, there was a chance that that we would be invaded. And so everyone's plucked in, right? And and so when you come back, it was a, it was a, it was the total nation went to war. So when you came back, you were plugging back into the same thing. When you are in Iraq or Syria or Afghanistan today, there's nothing to plug back into, especially if you're in the reserve component. And, and I think that's completely unnatural. Yeah, talk a little bit about that. I, I, you know, World War II. So uh, before he was wounded, my grandfather was, I think he was over there for three years or something, two years, whatever it was. Um, Normandy, Rhineland, France. Uh, I've read about some of the battles that uh, his unit fought in. Absolutely mm-hmm. brutal. How he survived as long as he did, uh, I don't know. And, you know, I don't know his total history when he came back, but he came back, became a machinist. Um, I, I don't think he went to, like, counseling mm-hmm. and lived a full life. And I always knew him as the nicest, kindest man mm-hmm. uh, ever. And now it seems to be the huge focus on the PTSD element and the counseling mm-hmm. and the 22 suicides a day mm-hmm. and all the things like – is it because we didn't have those resources or acknowledge it back then? Or what's the mm-hmm. difference? So, so I think it's two things. Um, it's, it's probably more, but simplifying it down to two things. One, I think that that generation was just harder, right? Um, mm. and, and when I mean harder, you, people people hear you say something like, oh, they were harder. It, it doesn't mean that I think that our current generation is at fault, right? Because it's easy to say the generation after you is soft, right? Oh, I used to walk, you know, 10 miles of school and blah, blah, blah. Um, but they were harder because life and generally was harder, right? Mm-hmm. They, they, they lived in, um, they lived closer to extended family because they weren't as spread out. Most of them were agricultural. Um, so they were around death a lot more than we are, right? Um, right. I met you in Ohio. You now live in Colorado, right? Yep. Um, that didn't really happen that much back then, right? You, you were raised in Peoria, Illinois, and your grandparents were there and your cousins were there and you saw your one cousin that died and you had a younger sister that died of polio, right? And, 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 um, right? and so I think people, it was a tougher life. 
So people were closer to things like death. They were used to suffering. There was no air conditioning, right? They were used to being hot. They were used to being cold, you know? And, and so, mm. um, you know, uh, most work at that point was manual labor. So they were literally harder people. So that, there's an aspect of that, right? Uh, and I think if you combine that aspect with um, this idea of integrating back into society that completely supports you, right? Um, mm-hmm. So I, I, th- I think those two probably account for, for 80% of it. Um, you, I, a third element might be purpose. And so um, purity of purpose, what, what, what you had in World War II, I mean, man, I, you know, I, you can argue that we haven't had uh, a, a, a war with the heightened level of purpose of World War II since World War II. And I think the purpose of, hey, they're taking over the world. They're putting people in ovens. This is objectively bad. There's no misinformation, right? right. There, there, there's no two sides. Although if you go back there, there was there was two sides, and some people didn't want us to get involved and understand that. But but your purity of purpose, man, was was a hundred percent. So now you have a cause. Uh, now you have okay, I'm doing this for a good reason. So, you know, I don't know that that's as clear. It was clear after uh, 9-11, and you remember 9-11. Yeah. I was at Ranger School during 9-11. Um, and so, you know, that, the first couple of years after 9-11, absolutely. I would argue that as generations have gotten older and older and past 9-11, they're like, well, why, why are we here again? Like, what's the, you know, what's the cause? And it's a good cause. You know, I, mm. I mean, absolutely, it's a good cause, right? There's, there are really bad people. Uh, we are trying to spread democracy. These are all valuable, absolute good causes. But was it to the level of an existential threat like you had in World War II? No. And we haven't had an existential threat since World War II. So I, I think it's kind of a soup of those three things uh, in my mind uh, of, of why you see PTSD much more prevalent. Man, that was a lot. That was a lot. <laughs> <laughs> that was deep, man. That was deep. Don't worry, we can edit through this. That was a lot of shit. <laughs> How does this go? I actually wrote this down. I was going to ask you, you know, dealing with adversity, where we're going, Mm -hmm. how we're getting away from things, living a very, I don't want to throw a blanket over it, but kind of a soft, very convenient life. I push Mm -hmm. a button on my phone, food arrives, a car arrives, anything, Mm -hmm. you know, I don't need Mm -hmm. to do anything. Mm -hmm. Uh, We got the introduction of, we can get into this too. We got the introduction Mm -hmm. of AI, all Mm -hmm. the things like, where's this going? Yeah. I I tell you, um, we're victims of our own success, Mm -hmm. right? Um, you can argue, uh, what's the, what's the saying? Uh, uh, good times create, uh, create, uh, bad men or weak men, weak men create bad times, bad men, uh, or, yeah. or bad times create, you know, strong men, strong men create good times, right? Something, right. something like that. I think it's phenomenal, right? I, yeah. I, it is. If you look at, you know, we were just looking at your, your chart of, uh, of history mm-hmm. that showed civilizations, right? And went back to about 3000 BC. Well, if you, if you were to break out the Hittites, the Egyptians, right? The, the Mycenaeans, the whoever, right? All of them have this arc, right? And, and the arc is, right, uh, post-agricultural, hey, now we have excess people to do things. Now we're making society better. Now we're building institutions. Now society is even getting better and we're more successful. But then that success causes the downward turn, right? Mm. And, and it's like, the, it's an arc of civilizations. And I think that that chart's really cool because it shows civilizations in terms of bubbles, right? The biggest one being the Romans. Um, but like, no matter what civilizations on there, they all have follow the same arc, right? And so I would argue that we're victims of our own success. And, and this is why the healthiest thing we can do is to bring artificial adversity back into our lives. That is, is why your friends are, are, are doing the expeditions, right? That is why people want to train uh, jujitsu. That's why people are joining CrossFit gyms. We hunger for adversity. We need adversity to fulfill our, our, our full potential. I, I think that what, what you're seeing nowadays is that you can order food at just by pushing a button. Um, you have to throw uh, adversity in there or else you're never going to develop discipline. And once you don't have discipline, all, all is lost. And mm. so it's a victim of our success thing, right? And that's why I, I, that's why I don't hold a particular generation responsible. But I, you, you hear the boomers get a lot of flack, right? Right. Uh, man, the boomers paid, a, you know, they, they did some good stuff, right? And mm. so, um, you know, I would say that it was their success that made our generation successful, and it's our success that's making the generations after us. But also it's making people softer along the way because I'm certainly not as hardcore as my grandfather was. I would argue you're not either, right? right. Uh, my grandfather was not as hardcore as his grandfather. His grandfather died fighting for for the union in the civil war, you know? Mm. And so, so I think there's something to that. Right. And so I think that the solution to the problem 
is is this kind of artificial uh, adversity thing, right? And it takes a lot of discipline, right? And it takes a lot of parenting and mentoring to say, hey, I know that you don't have to do the hard thing, uh, but do the hard thing because the hard thing is the only way you're ever going to scratch your potential. And, and if you if you multiply that at the societal level, uh, that's when you get a society that's not going down, it's going up. So we talked about this at lunch. Um, you know, I'm 46, you're 46. 77, Star Wars. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, you can look 46, you can look 40, you can look 60 at our age. Yeah. And what, you know, we talked about adversity, and, and there are a lot of folks that maybe not, they don't face that in, in their life. If somebody came to you and was like, where do I start? Mm. That white belt in jujitsu, yeah. that, that guy that rolls into class, he's our age, mm -hmm. and maybe he's a little bit overweight, and he's never really done anything in his life, mm -hmm. all the way back to, you know, the guy with the bourbon collection or whatever it was I mentioned. Mm -hmm. And he's like, I, I, what do I do? Yeah. What it's do I easy. do? It's easy. I think it's so easy. It's so hard, but it's so easy. <laughs> so don't quit. Mm. Consistency. Right. All right. So I think everything, I think that the value of diversity is you develop discipline. Discipline is, in my opinion, the greatest of all virtues, right? It's the most important of all virtues. And, and, and it's why I think fathers are so important to families, because that tends to be the thing that the father focuses on more than anything else is discipline. But of all the other virtues, if you only have one virtue in life, discipline's the one you want, right? Mm. And so, uh, so how do you develop discipline? Well, when you start jujitsu, you come up with a plan. Say you're going to train three days a week and you train three days a week, right? Mm -hmm. And then when life gets in the way and you have a kid in a new job, maybe you train one day a week, but you never stop, right? And, and, and that, that's how you start anything is, is, is consistency, right? So we're extremely adaptable animals and all we need is the stimulus, but you need a lot of that stimulus. And so you're gonna have to create that stimulus in you and how do you do that? By being consistent, that's it. It's literally that simple. So you, you, you talked about, you know, difference between a white belt and a black belt. You know, they, I've, heard an, I've heard it put another way, um, right? So what's the hardest belt? Is it black belt? Is it brown belt? No, the hardest belt's white belt because mm. you have to start, right? Yeah. Right. And, and then to become a black belt, it's easy. You just don't stop. And the escalator analogy is you just don't get off the escalator. The escalator may slow down and it may speed up, but don't get off the escalator. And, and, and once you can do that, um, I think everything else falls in. I, I think that's the hardest thing. It's the simplest thing, but it's also the hardest thing. And Mike Tyson, who I think Mike Tyson is the Yogi Berra of our, gener of, of, yeah. of, of our generation. I really do. Uh, I, he, that guy has some gems. <laughs> and I, I think one of my favorite ones uh, that he has is, uh, is discipline, is doing something that you hate like you love it. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Just fun. I mean, like, like, where's that come from? You know, it's, it's just like, <laughs> completely spot on and perfect, right? Mm -hmm. Doing something that you hate like you love it. That builds the discipline and, and gives you the adversity on a day to day basis, right? There, uh, most mornings I don't want to wake up. My alarm clock goes off. I'm like, man, my God. Ah. But I do it anyways, right? Because I have a son and I have a daughter and I have a family and I have to keep myself sharp. And so it's tough when it's February and it's cold. You don't want to go out there and work out. That's why I love the military. You know, the military kind of gives you an excuse, you mm -hmm. know, to, to get consistent, right? There's a saying about PT, it's not the most important training that you do, but it's the most important training that you do every day, right? Yeah. And I, I think in the totality, in, in the total of your career in the military, perhaps getting up to do PT every day was the secret sauce. And so, so my, my advice to someone wanting to challenge themselves is start something and don't stop. That's it. So if you were to define it, in a sense or two, discipline being the most important virtue. Mm. How would you like specifically word that? I mean, I think it's incredible. I, I remember this reel of Jocko talking about discipline, Mike Tyson mm -hmm. talking about discipline. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. If you had to put a quote on the wall, discipline <clears throat> is, is it, is it Mike Tyson's quote? Is it? Ooh, I don't know if I'd use the Mike Tyson quote. Um, I'd have to check. I have some quotes written down that, that I've heard along the way that are pretty good. Um, I don't know. That Mike Tyson was pretty good, man. <laughs> All right. So, so no, you know, I, I say though that, right. The, the, Abraham Lincoln has a, a quote and I have a terrible memory. So for you guys watching, you're going to go back and say, ah, oh, he didn't say that exactly, but, but I'm right. going to repeat the gist. Right. So, uh, uh, Lincoln had, uh, had a really good quote. It's something like discipline is valuing, uh, valuing what you like, most over what you like now or something to, to, to that effect. Right. Mm. And, and so it's, it's, it's kind of like investing, right? I could take this money and spend it, 
uh, or I can put it in my 401k and then have it in the long, long term. Right. It's kind of th- right. that, that idea. It's, 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 um, yeah, it's, that's a tough one. That's, that's a tough one. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I thought about bringing this up and, um, we can get into it as much as deep or as shallow as you want to. And it doesn't have anything to do with the military, but when we mm-hmm. talk about discipline and we talk about, uh, overcoming things like, uh, PTSD, um, and we talk about men and specifically, uh, men being better leaders and men being, uh, you know, all the things <clears throat> I think a huge part of, and you can check me on this. I think a huge part of that component is the discipline to leave the past in the past. Mm. Um, and specifically for me, and I know maybe a little bit for you, we haven't gotten too deep into it, but however your childhood goes, Mm. all the traumatic things that might've happened to you. Mm. I've got some heavy, heavy baggage myself Mm -hmm. from all those years and then joining the army and then all the things that happened uh, in my twenties and not holding on to that. Maybe this ties a little bit into PTSD and what we Mm. experienced in the military, not holding on to that and letting that weigh you down like a fucking anchor. That's hard, man. Super hard. And yeah. I, and I would say we, we think of discipline. We think of waking up and doing pushups. We think of yeah. being in the gym, CrossFit shit. But some of that is 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 mental capacity to overcome. Yeah. So I, I, I like the way the Stoics view that, right? So, you know, it's, it's funny, um, you know, growing up, uh, yeah, it's funny. You go through this kind of liberal conservative arc in your life, right? Mm-hmm. And so and uh, my, my minor in college was philosophy. And I just loved it. But I never liked the Stoics, right? I, I, I like the kind of pie in the sky, idealism kind of type of stuff. Uh, I, I like a lot of the Eastern philosophies, Zen, et cetera. Um, but like as I've gotten older, I'm like, man, I think the Stoics might have it right. Like the Stoics got it. Right? Yeah. And so, and, and so they, first of all, discipline is, is, is their big thing, but, but like, it's, it's literally, um, it, it, it's literally accepting what's happened. It, 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 I think the Christianity picked up a, a lot of some of the Stoic philosophy and, you know, it's the knowledge to know what you can control and, and what you can't. Right. And, mm. and, and so, um, you know, and Stoicism is like, Hey, that happened. Okay. Yeah. Now let it go and focus on what you can control moving forward. And, and that's it. And you're right. There is a discipline to that, to being, being able to let go. And I, I tell you, of all, all my traits, right, we all have negative traits. That's probably the toughest thing for me, right? My ego is tough, but then not letting go of the past. I, like you, came from a pretty rough uh, background, uh, lots of traumatic stuff. I think the way you frame it's important. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and this is kind of goes, ties back to my issue with PTSD, Okay. I think when we were talking about PTSD years ago, um, uh, you know, I made a comment to you of like, hey, you can't look at PTSD like it's a problem, right? You you can look at it like the other way, as in like the guys that don't get PTSD are like sociopaths, right? You, you, I mean, mm-hmm. it's, like, it's like, man, like, wow, that didn't bother you? Like that should bother you. And if yeah. it doesn't bother you, then there's probably something missing there. Um, I, I think when you had something traumatic happen in your childhood, if you attach a layer of guilt to it and, and you frame it as a bad thing and you frame it as this trauma is bad, which our society does. And it's the worst thing that our society does, right? It's, it's, we create victims, which I think vic- being a victim is worse than being victimized, mm. right? Um, because the mentality of being a victim uh, is almost impossible to overcome. And so I think you framing what has happened in your life, you can frame it in two ways. You know, you mentioned uh, uh, Jocko, you know, he has this great bit where like, hey, it's raining, good. You know what I mean? <laughs> or hey, you know, I stubbed my toe, good. Or, or hey, we got no sleep and we got to do a mission, awesome, right? Yeah. So what he's doing there, I think the value of that is is framing, right? And, and if I can frame... If I could frame that situation as, hey, it's not a negative, right? This is fuel for my fire, right? Like, yeah. good. Like, I expect the bad things. It's weird if bad things don't happen, right? We look at nature, right? Bad things happen all the time. You, it, 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 you know, life happens, and this is a stoic thing. It's how you think about it, right, is, 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 is really what drives you, right, as a person, mm. right? You're, you're made up of your thoughts. And if something bad happens to you or something good happens to you, it really only matters how you think about it, right? So something good can happen to you. If you think about it in a negative way, then it's going to be bad. Mm. If something bad happens to you and you think of it in a positive way, then it could be good, right? And so that ties back to your idea of like, you know, childhood baggage, right? Yeah. Um, you know, how do you frame it? Like, like I went through a lot of stuff, um, but I framed it. I was like, good, man. Like that, that made me stronger, Right. Yeah. I've been through the fire. Right. Mm. You know, when I went to Iraq, um, you know, I grew up in a neighborhood where we had a kid killed every year on my bus stop. Right. By getting shot. Right. And so, like, I've been around a, a pretty high level of violence. And so when I was in Iraq, I wasn't shocked by the violence. Right. And so I, I so I, I could frame growing up in a bad neighborhood as like, oh, woe is me. Or I could frame it like, thank God that when I got to combat, 
it wasn't as shocking to me as maybe as it was to someone else, right? So, you know, it, it's, it's about framing, I think. And if you could frame that trauma and realize that as humans, you need trauma. Like, like you should only be worried if you haven't had trauma. Mm. If you haven't had trauma, like, man, that's scary. You know what I mean? Like, that's, it's really scary if you haven't had trauma, if you haven't had adversity, if you haven't had something to overcome. So if you could frame whatever happened to you through that lens, then it becomes something that builds you instead of something that tears you down. And, and I think that's the trick. And, and I say that like I'm an expert. I got shit that happens all the time that, that I'm like, oh, man, why did I do this? I, and you ruminate, right? And your brain, your brain catches on and you after action review it over and over and over and you get this rumination. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I think that's what um, I, I think that's what the philosophers, uh, you know, mean when they say, you know, um, having control over, over your mind is, mm. is, 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 is the, is the most important thing is being able to stop that rumination cycle. Right. 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 That thing that like when you wake up at three in the morning and you're kind of drifting off and then it like, it, it, it's like you get bit by it. Right. And then you're just ruminating on it. I think if you can turn that into a positive thing, uh, you know, and then not thinking about it, uh, in those terms, um, th- then you can grow instead of it bringing you down. You mentioned something that uh, I thought I was the only person that does this, but I would say probably the worst moments uh, in my day, and it doesn't happen all the time, but that four to five in the morning when I kind of half asleep or half awake yeah. and I ruminate on stuff and I just yeah. feel like a terrible fucking person yes. and all the mistakes I've made and yes. all the things, that, right. is a, that is an awful experience. Yeah. That, that's a hell of a, a thing that we're faced with as humans, right? Because... Right, because because we have like the amygdala and, and like the kind of reptilian mammal brain, mm. right? That everyone else has. That that's like your gut instinct, and at, right, and that thing kind of runs. But then you have like this this like like the, like this frontal cortex part, which is logic, and then like humanity tries to like cram these two things together, right? Mm. You know, uh, uh, you know, there's there's. Um, uh, there's a lot of examples of, of that dichotomy throughout history, right? It's the it's the flesh versus the um, heavens, or it's the it's the riding the elephant. Ver, ver, this the elephant versus the rider. I think Thomas Haight puts put it like that. Like, hey, you have this kind of animal brain that's the elephant, and then you have this rider, and who's really in control, right? Well, they got to find a balance, right? And so, like, y- your mind is wired to to learn from things and get better right so what do you do you start assessing what happened and you start doing an after action review in your brain and that's incredibly important if you're building a log cabin right right and then you have to say well shit i did that wrong well the next time i do it i'm, I'm going to do it like this and that rumination is extremely important to be able to do that or hey i'm hunting this deer and every time i, I go this way i'm not successful but if i go this way i'm successful right it's almost, it's like the process of learning right and it's what mm. makes us special um but then how Having the ability to like let go of that rumination um, is, I mean, that's true mastery, right? And that's kind of what the Stoics aim for, right? Or that's what the the Buddha aims for, right? They want to get to that that nirvana, that that part where you can just let go, and uh, and everyone has that rumination, like everyone. Like I would say, if you don't have that rumination, you're probably a social bitch or something, <laughs> right? I mean, it's, like you're not normal if you don't have it, right? Yeah. <clears throat> and I think the more successful you are, and I think that uh, the you know the higher level you operate, the higher level you vibrate at, the higher frequencies. I think the more you can fall into that rumination game, which is why I think meditation is so important because that's the only thing I've found that can stop the room. Alcohol can obviously do it, but that's not the way you want to go. Uh, you know, obviously drugs, prescription uh, can do it, but you don't want to go that way either. You know, exercise helps and meditation is the only thing that can help you. <clears throat> I think what meditation does is the value of meditation, and I'm by no means an expert. I've mm. only been doing it for a few years, but it, 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 the act of it is I'm focusing on one thing, one, two, three, four, five. And then at six, you start thinking about something, right? And that's yeah. rumination is what that is, right? It's I'm going off and my brain is going off on this little journey now. Uh, oh, man, I got to get an oil change. I went out to do the tires. I don't want to do the tires. I should probably change the super thing about it. And then you come back, oh shit, seven, eight, nine, 10. You start over one, two, three. Should I get a haircut, right? Yeah. This is kind of your brain going all over the place. The value of meditation is not in that you've gone off to ruminate, it's the ability of acknowledging it and then bringing it back. Mm. So that means that that will then build the ability that at four in the morning, at five in the morning, when you wake up and you're like, shit, is it so early? Should I just get up or think I'm going to go to bed? Or, and then you start going off on this, this tangent, right? It gives you the ability to pull it back and say, stop, what are you doing? You know, like, like, mm. don't think about that. Bring it back. Let's think positive thoughts. Let's count sheep. Let's listen to a documentary and fall asleep. Right. Yeah. Uh, that's the value of, of meditation because everyone does that. 
And if, and if someone tells you they don't do it, <laughs> be careful with that person. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm glad to hear that I'm not the only person that does that. <laughs> You're not the only person in this room. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, I'd be anxious to hear, uh, hear your thoughts on, uh, so I started reading this book. It's one of those um, once a day you read a couple pages type mm-hmm. thing. Mm-hmm. But it's big on intention. Mm. Words have power. Uh, I fully intend that this to be an amazing podcast, and mm-hmm. I fully intend to, and I think shaping your thoughts um, especially with me, you know, mm-hmm. starting a business and doing all the things. I think that's incredibly important. Like you mentioned, ruminating, being able to pull it back through mm-hmm. meditation. I think having intentions, shaping your thoughts, shaping how you view the world uh, is incredibly important. Uh, otherwise, I think, it, man, you could sink into a deep depression maybe. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I think that's hard too. Uh, Very I think, hard. I think, uh, uh, you know, you kind of watch like a, there, there, there's the, the, the hippie kind of generation, uh, or not a hippies kind of post that, but where they would be like, look in the mirror, I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, right. and people like me. You know what I mean? <laughs> is that a just movie like, or something? Yeah, oh, yeah, right. And it's like the butt of a lot of jokes. Yeah, and yeah. I'm like, oh, that's ridiculous. But man, as I've gotten older, I'm like, I understand what they're doing. Like, like they've over commercialized it and they're not doing it right, you know? Mm. Uh, but like, self-talk, right? The way that you think, uh, like your, your words, you're just a, um, combination, uh, or su- uh, you're, you're a sum of your thoughts. Yeah. So if you can somehow change your thoughts, and I think that some people kind of have a negative bias and some people have a positive bias. I, I know I have a negative bias, right? My wife tends to have more of a positive bias. I can see to my kids, my, my son has one of the best positive biases I've ever seen. I'm jealous mm-hmm. of him. My daughter, she's a little bit more negative, just like me. Right. Yeah. And so we all kind of have our biases, but, um, but like, if you can, if you can stop those narratives in your head, um, which, you know, which, I don't know, when, when is that instilled? Probably when you're a child, right? Mm. Pro- probably in how your parents interacted with you initially was probably the foundation of that. I don't, I don't know. I'm just, just guessing, but how can you change that narrative in your head? Right. And if you have grown up with a negative narrative in your head because of trauma that has happened to you, then your ruminations are going to be categorically negative. Right. Mm. And, if, and now what you've done is you're, you're basically brought negativity, right. In, in, into your, into your world. Right. And, and so, um, so how do you change that? And so it, that's where the intention comes from, right? Because so many people, I think, w- w- when they're just thinking thoughts in their head, they feel like they're a passenger, mm. right? And and then you're kind of mindless. And it's just, ah, wherever, oh, look, that's a cool logo. This is a cool skull thing. Or, you know, and, right. and, your, and your monkey brain is just like wherever, right? And like, you're, you know, which is why, oh, cell phone, look, I can I can focus on something. And now I'm not ruminating anymore. Right. Um, uh, and, and if you can make that, uh, those narratives positive mm. instead of negative, I think it's life changing. I don't know how to do it. Uh, I'm trying. I think intention is the way, because you go from being mindless and not driving your thoughts to now driving your thoughts. I think, I think that's the layman's definition of intentional mm-hmm. is, is, hey, I'm not going to think the negative stuff. I'm going to think the positive stuff. And mm-hmm. so if I'm going to do something, I'm going to be focused on what I'm doing. I'm not being mindless, uh, and, and, and I'm not letting myself kind of go off with negative banter in my head is the best way I could see it, and, and I don't know. Uh, but uh, I think that's what they're doing. And, and it's similar to I'm good enough, right? <laughs> People like me. You know what I mean? I, I, mm-hmm. I, th- I think there's probably some positive there, right? And, and I understand why they do that because you can almost brainwash yourself, right? Yeah. And you could brainwash yourself negative, which we mainly do, or you could brainwash yourself positive. And you are the sum of your thoughts. So why not brainwash yourself positive? I think is what they're, it's the gist in my humble opinion. Yeah. Cause I used to do the whole put sticky notes around the house and I think you have to find what works for you, but yeah, just, uh, <laughs> stating that positive intention or yeah. this is what I'm going to do today. And, and not like I have a vision board and I hang a mm-hmm. Ferrari on it or something, but yeah. something yeah. more reasonable to control or drive what you want to do, especially if you're in a position where, uh, like I said, you're starting a business or you're in a very yeah. vulnerable spot. Yeah. Like you have to think, there is going to be a way out. Absolutely, yeah. I, I think what you're talking about there too is the idea of, of you begin with the end in mind. Yeah. And, uh, and and I think there's a huge value to, um, you know, you, you've heard people say things like, well, you know, write down your goals and, and then mm-hmm. you know, read those every day and then, and then kind of head in that direction. Um, 
to me, that's almost like strategy, you know, yeah. and, and it's beginning with the end in mind. And, and that's another way you could be intentional because, um, right. You're just not mindlessly doing something. Everything that you do builds to that goal, right? I bought this microphone because this microphone has better sound quality and that's going to uh, provide a better product for my listeners, which is going to help me achieve my goal that much. Right. Yep. Um, and so I think there's a lot of value to that. And, 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 uh, you know, it's like strategy, right? So, so people think that strategy is something like scary, hard thing. And for whatever reason, the strategy consultants tend to get paid more than any other consultants when really it's probably the simplest thing, right? Strategy is easy. It's implementation is what's hard. Mm. Um, but, but what strategy is doing is simply saying, where are you? Where do you want to go? How do you get there? Yeah. That's all it is. It's like, it's not, that's it. Like at the, you can go at the national interest level all the way down to I'm um, opening up a coffee shop, right? It doesn't matter. Where are you? Where do you want to go? What steps do you have to do to get there? Then you bring in the intention of everything that you do is tailored to doing that. It's almost like the story of the NASA janitor, right? Yeah, I think you've probably heard this story before. Like in the 60s, they'd go to NASA and, and you had an organization so aligned with where they wanted to go that everything everyone did had the intention of getting them there. And so when they talked to the janitor, they were like, hey, what are you doing here? You just mopped the floors. He's like, no, I'm helping us get to the moon, right? Mm -hmm. Because he's keeping it clean and safe for the engineers to go in and do the job, right? I think that's a great, great example of that intention that you're talking about. So when you say strategy, I just thought of a really cool way to tie this back. Where are you? Where do you want to go? How do I get there? Is it? I think it's possible. Um, where are you? Jiu-jitsu. I'm in a mm. very bad spot. Where do I want to go? <laughs> right? And how do I get there? Yeah. And you're talking about a flow state. Yeah. And wouldn't it be incredible to achieve that flow state in your life yeah. where um, you pull that from jiu-jitsu and, you know, mm -hmm. I'm in this bad position. I reverse and I get to this better position. Uh, and I think it is when you frame your mind in the right way, it's possible to achieve a little bit of that flow state. Mm to achieve your goals. Um, and when mm -hmm. I think back to, this is maybe, I don't want to say divulging too much, but you know, when I was maybe even at the, at the end of my military career, or even in my corporate career, uh, when I was making the most money I'd ever made, mm -hmm. I was probably the most miserable that I've ever mm -hmm. been. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't <laughs> framing my mind and I was yeah. very negative and I was doing all the things and I was boozing hard. And, mm -hmm. and, um, this idea of, you know, controlling your mind and, and being intention and intentional and being positive and having that flow state, mm -hmm. I think, God, it mm -hmm. all starts from within. It all starts from looking in the mirror. It all starts mm -hmm. from making that conscious decision. Mm -hmm. Um, because God, I just remember thinking like, man, I'm making all this money. I'm doing all this mm -hmm. stuff. And I, fucking hate every day. So I, I, I think that's the modern, uh, that's the, that's the state of modern man, right? Uh, yeah. who, who was it that said, uh, uh, you know, most men live lives of quiet desperation. Yeah. Was it like Emerson or Walsh, someone like, I don't forget who it was, but, uh, right. But like, man, think about that for a second, like quiet desperation, mm -hmm. like Jesus. And so I think that the way that you can do the hard corporate job, which I've done before, um, I, I, you know, I worked at GE, a phenomenal company, but boy, do you grind. And, yeah. uh, you can make that work if you use in the idea of intention and you mm -hmm. combine it with strategy. Hey, yeah, it's hard to go work 12 hours a day, but this is where I'm at. I want to get to this retired state yeah. and I'm going to bust my ass to achieve the resources in order to create that reality. And then you can turn that whole, I'm going to the corporate grind thing mm -hmm. down to a positive situation. Now in your situation, because you're the most entrepreneurial guy I've ever met. I've met a lot of people. I've gone right. to business school. I've never met anyone as entrepreneurial as you. Um, the old adage of if you do what you love, you never have to work a day. You're right. kind of the walking embodiment of that. And, and the reason I think why that works is, is because you're so bought in to what you're doing that it doesn't feel like work. Right. And, and, uh, and that's why, you, you know, I, so I'm not speaking for you, but I assume you love what you're doing because right. everything that you do is, is reaching towards your goal mm -hmm. and, 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 and you're driving it. I think you could probably do that in a corporate job too, but, but, but it has to be, you have to kind of figure out what your goals are. Right. And, and, yeah. well, you know, goals are to own a house and be able to live off of retirement, spend time with my family when I'm still young enough to do it. Okay. Well, that's your goal. Well, then the corporate world works, right? Mm -hmm. And you could find a way to be intentional and you could find a way to be happy and you could start controlling your ruminations and you could start spinning them to the positive. Uh, but you have to do that on purpose, I think. Right. And that, and that's tough. Um, why was it, and maybe the 
don't charge me for the therapy session. <laughs> uh, when you talk about the court- I'm your therapist, you're in trouble, brother. <laughs> <laughs> Why, uh, and maybe you, you felt this in your own life. Uh, I had no problem in the military, you know, a very structured environment. A very rank heavy system, yeah. very, you know, do what you're told, yeah. you know, with some leeway. I absolutely despised that in the mm. corporate in- sector. Yeah. Um, and, and if, you know, like I said, no problem in the military. Yeah. Go clean that toilet. I'm on yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Purity of purpose. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's it. I think it's purpose, right? Mm. Because think about the way you frame the military. You, you frame the military through your grandfather, yeah. right? And, 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 facing existential threats and adding value to the hive and being a defender, which mm-hmm. is kind of like a primary role that men have, or we defend and provide are probably the two big things that, that, that we do. Well, when you're in the military, you're kind of like that janitor at NASA, right? Mm-hmm. You just, you even mentioned cleaning a toilet, right? You can yeah. go clean the toilet because you're cleaning the toilet because it feeds the bigger purpose of the military, right? Yeah. So because you have a sense of the military and you're tying it back to a positive experience with your grandfather, when you ruminate and think about the military, it's in a positive light. When you go to the corporate world, especially if it's owned by a private equity company, mm. and they're just there squeezing for pro- for profit, you you can't tie the purpose to the company. That's kind of what I was saying. By you can find positive experiences in the corporate world, but you have to tie it to personal goals, mm. right? So the reason why you hate the structure and playing the game in the corporate world is because you understand that the purpose is to make someone else a lot of money. But if you could find a way to make that your personal purpose of, of paying off a house and retiring early, then you could spend that in a positive positive way. I think that's pro- that's probably what it is. And, and I think that's the advantage that the military has, right? First of all, the, the advantage that the military has is is it's a true meritocracy. There's not many meritocracies left anymore. Mm-hmm. Uh, and historically, the military was re- really, I'd say, the first meritocracy. And so you like the structure and the meritocracy and the, and the fact that you can see, man, if I work hard and, and I work out hard and I study and become technically and tactically profession, or proficient, um, then I'm going to do well here, right? And, and you saw that, right? And, and when you see that, uh, there's a lot of positives there. In the corporate world, you might be the best, but maybe you're not going to get picked up for whatever reason, right? And so there, there's a yeah. lot there too. And you're an entrepreneur. You're an extremely creative guy. Uh, I've never seen anyone that's come up with as many business successful businesses <laughs> as you have. Right. And uh, and I'll tell you, I don't have like, like that's a brave thing. I don't have that. Like that thing mm. that you have, I don't have. And, and and I look up to you a lot of times, and I'm like, man, if I just had a little bit of fill in me, <laughs> right? Then then I, then I I can I can go off and, and pivot and, and do something different. Uh, but there's a there you have two things there. You have a creativeness and and. And then you have the bravery to do it. And I don't know if it's brave or you don't see risk. I don't know which one it is. Yeah. But you pull the trigger and you go. And it's like, wow, right? It's that, it's that kind of poor, poor dad, rich dad dichotomy. Mm-hmm. I mm-hmm. definitely grew up with a poor dad. So I tend to go with like the safe bet, right? That's kind of me. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, you know, uh, and, and sometimes you can have some regret there. And so seeing the way that you, you pull the trigger and, and just get after it, man, that's, that's awesome. I have the picture behind you. Uh, I think that's Normandy Beach. Anyways, World War II landings. And uh, first of all, I love that photo. But it, the, the Higgins boat opening up. To, <laughs> yeah. yeah. It it reminds me, uh, you know, I read somewhere like, you know, when those guys landed, obviously there is no way out. You're forward or you're dead. Burning like, the boats. That's it. Yeah. And that's kind of how I tend to look at things like yeah. pull the trigger and, and there is no plan B. Yeah. And it's fucking scary sometimes. Yeah. But also it drives you like yeah. it's what makes you one in the morning, you're on the computer or 6 a.m., 4 a.m., you're on the computer, you know, whatever yeah. it takes, whatever yeah. it takes type of situation. Yeah, you have that burn the boats mentality, man. Like yeah. that's, oh man, that's awesome. Yeah, that's <laughs> the way to do it, man. Yeah, yeah, keep yeah. doing it, yeah. Yeah, I, one thing I found in the corporate sector, and I can't speak for all corporate jobs, and I know there's, I actually know guys that love them. Uh, in the military, if you, you know, work hard, with a purpose, do the things, do all the right things, and, and then you try to achieve the best results possible for the team. Not only rewarded, but you know your your reviews reflected. You're looked highly upon. For the most part, I would say I, I was actually I noticed that I had the opposite result was achieved in, in the corporate sector. Mm-hmm. It was almost like, hey, dude, what are you doing? Trying to make us look bad? Take it yeah, easy. Yeah, yeah. Take it easy. Yeah. So what you're talking about there? Um, and I didn't talk about this earlier when I was talking about the the goodness of the military. Um, the military is one of the only organizations where I am fully invested in developing my team, mm-hmm. right? Uh, the military, it's, it's, a, 
it's a people business. And, and my job as a leader is to take care of my people that do the work, right? Especially as, you know, as an 06, I don't do a lot of work. And if I'm doing work, something, something bad's going on. Um, so I, I am invested in bringing up the next generation behind me. And, I, and, and it's almost like the fatherly instinct to mentor, mm-hmm. right? And we talk about toxic masculinity um, and, uh, and, and a lot of things that gets overlooked in masculinity is mas- mascul- a masculine uh, trait is to mentor. Mm-hmm. And, and it's expressed very well in the military. And, uh, and so, you know, when you're a young soldier or a young lieutenant, there are people investing time in making you better. Now, they might be doing it in a harsh way, mm-hmm. but they are making you better. And I'm sure you've experienced this enlisted through being an NCO and then becoming an officer and then becoming a field grade officer, right? Mm-hmm. You've both had people invest in you and you've invested in people. Yep. You don't have that as much in the corporate world. There are companies, I, I was lucky I worked at GE and, and, and they, yeah, I mean, they, they, they did, you know, not as much as the military, but I could tell that they were trying to bring up that next generation. That's very rare in the corporate world. Mm-hmm. So in the military, we want you to be better. Like, like it's, it's kill the master, right? That's kind of my, my philosophy of teaching jujitsu. My goal is to make you beat me. Right. Mm-hmm. And I'm not successful until you can beat me. So you have to kill the master. Well, the military is the same way. And I, I have, it's funny, you know, I came up being mentored by folks in the military. A, a guy named Colonel, uh, Colonel Hatfield was one of them. He's recently retired. Uh, but, you know, that guy kind of brought me up along with him. Right. I met him when he was a major and I was a captain. Uh-huh. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and by the end of our professional relationship, he was the chief of staff and I was the G4, right. And, mm-hmm. and each, each of sixes. And so, um, you know, I have folks behind me that I've kind of latched onto early in their careers as they were captain and majors. And now I'm kind of bringing them on with me. Right. And why is that? Cause I want them to be better than me. And the military is one of the only institutions where, where that's a major part of it. Is, is, hey, we want to make you better. And I, I think there's probably a little bit of that, right? When you get to the corporate world, it's like, hey, don't do that. I don't want you to make more than me, or I, I don't want you to yeah. be a threat at one point. But the military is kind of like this conveyor belt, right? You do your 20 years, and then you retire, right? And so so as you get older in the military, you be, find yourself as a steward of the, of the profession. And and so as you as you are at the sunset of your your career in the military, it's really more about those people behind you. Right. That's really your legacy. Just like mm-hmm. as a human, your legacy, your children in the military, your legacy is your mentees. And so you put a lot of effort into them. And as you get senior in rank, it's really just like I said, I don't do any work anymore. I make sure that the people that are doing the work are taken care of and are successful. And, and you're probably noticing that absence a little bit, I, w- I would imagine. You can't see it on camera, but there's a lot of like certificates on my wall, a lot of cool, <laughs> a lot of cool opportunities I've had in, in my military right. career. And I would say without question, every single one of those is a result of, uh, and you've met him, Colonel Chris Shond. Yeah. Uh, he just got promoted to an SES uh, in the, in the government sector, but. That's an executive for you guys out yeah, there. That don't senior know. executive. Yep. And, um, you know, latching onto that to him throughout my career, I was a second lieutenant he was a captain and kind of. Yeah. And that mentor mentee kind of relationship where he's like, Hey man, do you want to go to this school? Do you want to do this thing? Do you want yeah. to do that thing? Right. And, um, that was an incredible experience. Right. And I owe a lot to that guy and, uh, who stood by me in good times and bad times for versus like you said, the corporate sector, everybody's in it for yeah. themselves. That's right. Yep. Like, yep. fuck you. Yep. Yeah. Yep. That's Since exactly <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I mean, so your metric for success in the military is life or death existential. Your metric for success in the corporate world is profit. Yeah. Right. Purpose. Right. It's tough. It's not there. Purpose. I think, um, and that, you know, and that's what drives me to do this. That's what drives you to do what you do. Purpose. Mm-hmm. And I think that's, that's missing. I used to have a lot of those conversations in the corporate world with some friends and you're just like, you know, you talk about shareholder value and all mm-hmm. the things and that's cool. I mean, you know, but it's not mm-hmm. for you. Yeah. Uh, there's another book I'm reading called the happiness equation. Mm. And um, it talks about it's that bourbon plus cigars. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think I got that one figured out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it talks about doing it for you, and it talks about uh, actually not doing it for money. Uh, obviously, yeah. you need money, but you know, yeah. doing it for you and doing it for for that purpose. And and I think that uh, it's taken me a long time to find something like that. And yeah. a lot of people don't find that. Yeah. And it's incredibly uh, discouraging, I think, yeah. for those folks. So I would say to those folks that don't have that purity of purpose, make it your family. Right. Yeah. And so, uh, I'm, I'm blessed. I got a, I got an awesome wife. Um, you know, I, and I come from, uh, I come from two, three generations of divorce on both sides. Mm-hmm. Right. So my grandparents on both sides were divorced. My parents were divorced. I got divorced once. Right. So I, I literally didn't understand, um, 
family that well. Mm-hmm. But, you know, like I, 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 you know, I've got some extent. I got some uncles I look up to, some aunts I look up to, and you know, so, so it's not that I didn't have a family, but um, I didn't know what a like a true functioning family looked like until mm-hmm. I was. 32, 33. And I met my current wife and she's from Italy. And so, you know, and, and they, they, you know, it's almost like uh, you're going back to the fifties kind of, you know, family is king there. Mm-hmm. And so I got extremely lucky. I, I met her. And then I think that that helped me with some purpose in that, like, even uh, this is why I know I can, I can take a job where I just pound my head against the wall. I know I can do the core. I know I could go back to the corporate world because my purpose is my family. Mm-hmm. Right. So it doesn't matter if I'm walking through the woods to hunt a deer to feed my family for a month um, or I'm working on an Excel spreadsheet. Right. The end state is still the same. It's gaining resources for my family so that I can set them up to be successful. So whether or not it's the military where I get a lot of personal fulfillment for m- mentoring people and getting jobs done or it's the corporate world where you're banging your head against the ball sometimes. I, I think I could do both. Mm-hmm. Because my purpose is external to both of those. It, it's it's my family. But again, very lucky to to, to met who I met. Um, super lucky, like yeah. to the point where she thinks that she's lucky. That's that's how I have her conned. <laughs> yeah. uh, but man, like without that, like you know, uh, you know, that's I would say to the folks listening out there. You know, if you are in the corporate world and you're grinding, you have purpose, man. Right, right. You could still yeah. lay out the strategy, right, and you can see where am I at now, which is hard to do. What's my what's my hard self assessment. Where do I want to go and how do I get there? And sometimes grinding that corporate job is the way that you get there. And that's okay. As long as you have that purity of purpose. You know, we talked about uh, strong men and, you know, facing adversity and all the things that make a man what a man is. And I think we're, we're leading perfectly into this component of, so I've been divorced twice. And um, when I separated from the corporate world about a year ago, mm-hmm. And where I'm getting to this is, I think another component to being a strong man and being a man that's fulfilled is having a very strong, empowering, fulfilling woman Mm -hmm. with you. So I've been divorced twice, uh, a girlfriend now, Mary. And I remember uh, when I separated from the corporate world about a year ago, she was like, no, I was like, well, what what am I going to do? And she's like, well, what do you want to do? And I told her I wanted to do exactly this, Mm -hmm. motorcycles podcast, Mm -hmm. like the most outrageous idea, YouTube, dude, you're 45 years old at the time. And she looked at me and she was like, you should do it. Yeah. And I'm just like having somebody that's like putting wind in your sails at your back, cheerleader, all the things. uh, It's an incredible experience, very empowering, very much like the shit can be falling down over here, over Mm -hmm. here. I can get told no over there, over there. You're not going to do it. Not going to. And as long as that person's like, yes. Yeah, I believe in you. I, I yeah. think that that's a, a key component. Yeah, I tell you, man, life is a team sport, brother. And yeah. uh, and, and I, I say this a lot about the military, right? So I've had a pretty good run of it so far. I've been lucky, very lucky. And uh, and when people say, like, "Oh, you know, that's good. How'd you do it?" Uh, life's a team sport, man. And, and I was not the same officer before my wife. And hmm. uh, and and she's, you know, we talk about, uh, you know, uh, you know, being successfully in operation. You got to set conditions for, for your, mm-hmm. your success. I think Jim Kelly says it the best, right? Yeah. You got to set conditions for your success, right? He he has like the best quote I've ever heard. Uh, it's, uh, I don't want to go to a gunfight. I want to go to a shooting. <laughs> Right. Just like what a phenomenal way to think about it. Right. Well, yeah. how do you do that? You have to set conditions, right? You have to set yeah. conditions. Well, how do I, which is intention, which is where am I at? Where do I want to go? How do I get there? I have to set conditions for me to be successful in my life. My wife sets conditions, right? Mm-hmm. So, right. So, you know, she's, she's a stay at home mom with two master's degrees and the ability to work if she wants to, but like she clears the plate to where I just have to focus on work. Yeah, that's my, you know, I, I teach jujitsu, I have the discipline to get up and work out every day, but I'm able to go harder at work than other people are. Mm-hmm. Why? Because I don't have anything else. I have a rucksack on, but there's only work in it. There's nothing else, right? Because yeah. my, my wife has set the conditions to where she says, you do that, I'll do this. It's kind of like the agricultural revolution, right? I'm better at making corn. I'm really good at making wheat. I'm going to make a shit ton of corn and give you some wheat. I'm going to make wheat and give you some corn, right? Or whatever, right? Yeah. And you know, I think I mixed that up. But uh, <laughs> but like the idea was, was she, she's like, I got it. I'm setting conditions for you. You, you, you know, get after it, right? And that's a huge advantage. Like, like it's, I know I can work longer than you. I know I can work harder than you. I know mm-hmm. I can work and, and sleep in my office and get up and work again because I have someone like in my back. I have someone in my corner, right? That's mm-hmm. taking care of everything else. 
man, that's dangerous, right? That, that makes you really, really powerful. And that's that support you're talking about, right? And so. And I don't think you know it. Uh, I know you don't know it until you feel it. You, you yeah, might think you're yeah. there, but you're not there unless it's, uh, and what I mean by that is, you know, previous relationships or whatever. And you look back on that, you're like, I never had that. Yeah. And now I do. And it's actually yeah. incredible. Yeah. I, I think growing up in broken homes too, which, you know what, like 50% of marriages fell. Right. And so yeah. like, so we have generations, not people say, oh, this generation, like, no, it's generations of, of the family cell not being as prominent, right. Not being mm. the centerpiece of, of society anymore. Um, and so you have people that don't understand that it can be that way. And, uh, and I think that's a huge handicap, right. Not knowing that that's possible. Um, and, uh, and, and not knowing that, not knowing the concept of synergy, right? You know, the 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 sum is greater, or the yeah, the sum is greater than the whole, right? Or, or you know, that that that's a unique thing that humans do. It's mm-hmm. what sets us apart from the rest of the animals, in my opinion. Is you can do a lot of work, and I could do a lot of work, but man, if we get together, right? If you can do fifty, and I could do fifty, we get together. It's one hundred and twenty, right? Yeah. That's synergy, and that's what a good good support system is right and 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 if you grow up like i did never seeing it work right mm-hmm. uh, usually you can look at your grandparents both of my grandparents were divorced my parents were divorced i didn't know what right looks like till i was 35 right you know and 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 now i hope i can show that to my kids so do the italians do it better yeah man um i would say yes uh yeah cultures all cultures have strengths and weaknesses right um I guess and, we should have some context who you're married to and her family. Yeah. So my, so my wife, she's from, born and raised in Sicily, um, a small town on the Northern coast of Sicily, Capo de Orlando. And, uh, um, uh, you know, it's a kind of a touristy beach town. Like mm-hmm. you could, you could, if you had a good arm, you could throw a baseball and it would at least roll into the water. Mm-hmm. You know I mean? That's how mm-hmm. close they are to the water. Um, uh, but like they're old school Sicilian, like, like her parents are in their seventies now. And, uh, and, uh, you know, small town, 10,000 people, um, you know, you walk around the town with her and she, she says she has a hundred cousins and she's not exaggerating. Like it's a hundred. Oh, like, wow. like, yeah. Like, like imagine like, we're going to go get some bread or we're going to go to the jewelry store. Hey, if, hey, you know, Giuseppe, you know, and, and I'm like, I'm like my head spinning. Cause like, you know, I'm from America where we're spread out and, yeah. and separated from our family and, you know, uh, and living in huge cities. And so you have this anonymity that I think it's bad. Um, not there. Mm. And, uh, and, and their family, you know, they're, they, they don't like get together for holidays. Like they are always together. And so, uh, I, I don't know about all Italians, but the Italians from that town, yeah, they do it better. Absolutely. Um, but you know what, you, you take that, that same culture and you drop them in America and give it a generation or two. And they're probably just like us, right? That goes back to the mm. idea of being a victim of your success. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, I grew up, um, uh, I, never really knew my cousins or uncles or aunts or yeah. it was always just, you know, my parents and wherever we lived at totally different dynamic. Uh, now if you go to my mom's side, uh, Filipinos, yeah. everybody's about four feet tall. Uh, so I'm like a giant to them, but, <laughs> <laughs> but it's the same concept. Like, yeah, you yeah. know, you have generations living together yeah. in the same house yeah. and they're always on the weekends are always together and everybody's cousins yeah. of a cousins of a cousin. Yeah. And it's a very interesting dynamic. Now that I think about it, I think that's the way it's supposed to be. I, I, I really, really do. I, I think that's the way it's designed. You know, we had an interesting conversation earlier about um, the age you should have kids, mm-hmm. right? And uh, I think that you, the, the idea uh, that it takes a village to raise a kid is spot on. And, uh, mm. and our village uh, is really our extended family. And so like your Filipino side of the family, they all, you know, like you can have a baby that needs a diaper change and it might not be the mom that's changing. It might be the sister, right? It might be a grandma, it might be a cousin or, or a brother, right? That's the way it's supposed to work, right? And, mm. and I think that's, you know, now what happens in America is you get isolated and dropped off on an island all by yourself. Man, it's hard. You have that kid and you are breastfeeding every three hours. You are changing every diaper. You are with that kid 24 seven until man, maybe I can, they're old enough and I could take them to daycare and let them do it. Right. Because right. I also have to have a job. Right. And so like, I think that's an artificial, uh, kind of made up. I just don't think it's the best way. It's a way humans are adaptable. We can do anything, mm-hmm. but man, I, I don't, I don't think it's optimal. I would use the term optimal. It's not optimal. What's optimal is to have your sister and brother living on the same street. And if you have to go out on a date night with your husband, you could drop the kids off and they go on a date night, they give the kids to you and, and, and your grandparents are there. Right. And, and, and your cousins are across the street. Right. And, and the whole family acts like a team, And then the team can easily handle the child rearing versus us where we're going to drop you in a suburb two states away from your family 
uh, and say, good luck. You know, I don't think that's the way it's supposed to be. I think the Filipinos have it right. I think the Italians have it right. I think the Americans used to have it right. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I think that, uh, that we're suffering right now because we don't have that. Now, I think we can go back. Um, but, you know, and I don't think it's an obstacle we can't overcome. It's just not optimal. Right? It's, it's really difficult to do. Do you think we're sold on? So when I think about my own family, uh, and I'll use this loosely, the American dream. So all my brother, my sister, everybody has their own house. Everybody lives in their own city. Everybody's mm-hmm. spread out. Like it's it's the thing you're supposed to do. And we get together for Thanksgiving or Christmas versus the opposite, right? Yeah, yeah. So I would argue that the American dream is not the spread out part. Okay. And I think that's the artificial part that mm. we could fix and that hopefully technology allows us to fix, right? I, I think COVID was a step in the right direction um, of like, hey, you mean I don't have to be there in person, right? So I did a school this week at Fort Carson, bad weather. Uh, uh, and so we all flew in here to do this course, good course. Um, uh, bad weather happened. What did we do? Okay, we're going to do the course on Thursday in your hotel room on Teams. Right. Okay. And got some good stuff out of it. Next day, snowed again. Hey, you're gonna, we're going to finish it off. Or actually, I, we didn't do it the, the last day, but either way. Um, so like I, the idea that like I don't have to move oh, far away, I think is a step in the right direction. It's either that or, or, or consume locally, which will drive more jobs locally. But I don't think that we have to travel. And, and you know, I, I, think, I think that we need to relook that. And mm-hmm. I think that we'd be better off staying in our hometowns um, it's just, you got to find a way to have the economic base there in that hometown, um, which kind of goes back to consume and produce locally versus I'm going to consume this thing that was produced really far over there. Cause that means that the jobs are really far over there. And that means I got to go really far over there to get that job. And I think that's what r- can rip apart the family. Mm. So, so what I would like to see happen is, is families staying together more, right? You may, you know, you may not have to live on the same block, but live in the same city, you know, right? Um, you know, and, and be a, a constant part in, in your life. Um, I think, I think that's, that's the route we'd like to get back to, but man, that's hard to do, right? It's almost impossible right now. And I also think that, uh, you know, they're always like, come back to Ohio, come back to Ohio. For me, it was no really big deal to move across the country. Yeah. Uh, but a lot of people won't do that, you know, because we're, we're used to living in other countries all over, the, you know, every three years, your PCS or, yeah. you know, that's a permanent change of station. Yeah. Uh, the military <laughs> makes you move. Um, but for most people, uh, they're not going to do that. Mm-hmm. And so I'm like, yeah, even like come out and visit in Colorado. They're like, ah, so far away. Yeah. 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 It's yeah, interesting. It, 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 it's, you know, I think families need to move organically kind of. And, uh, and it's tough, man. Like when that was, so my, my, you, know, you mentioned my wife's situation. So, Interesting thing about her situation is um, the reason why she's in America is you know, her family separated in like the ni- 1910 maybe, mm. and uh, and so one uh, two two of the boys went to America, and then two of the boys stayed in Sicily, uh, and they got separated because back then there's no email right and and not mm. even sure they had telephones that could that could talk across the ocean right. So in the 1980s, uh, the, 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 the guys that went to Sicily, um, uh, one of them died and their granddaughter was going through their stuff and they found this letter from the 30s that had an address to Capo de Orlando, Italy. Oh, this is cool. Well, she's an airline stewardess, so she keeps it and says, well, the next time I go to Palermo, I'm going to go knock on some doors. Okay. So fast forward about 1991, 92, I could be off on the, on the years there, but like uh, she literally is in Palermo and she says, hey, taxi driver, take me to this address over there she knocked on the door hey do you know this person oh yeah that's our grandfather blah 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 and then the family reconnects so there was like this big dark age and where the family mm. had no contact for 80 years wow and then they reconnect and then they start traveling back and forth and my, my wife visits uh that they, they actually initially migrated to youngstown ended up in akron and my wife came to visit when she was younger and they said hey you should come to school here and we have this big university ohio state university you should try this and just so happened whenever i was going back to get my business degree uh, she was uh, in the italian department teaching and so that's how it happened right and so the, the but the idea is uh is you know um if, is is kind of backtracking here so it's scary to go away to Colorado, right? Um, yeah. And 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 I think when you do that, um, there's some risks there. And I think the main risks are starting a family is really hard. It's really hard to move from Ohio to California and start a family because mm-hmm. you're alone on an island. 
Yeah. And, and that's scary. You, you moved to Colorado, you know, pretty late in life to where, mm-hmm. you know, you weren't necessarily raising kids anymore. Right. Um, I, I think, I think it's more optimal to, to raise at least in the early child rearing ages, right. First five to 10 years. I, th- I think it's probably more optimal to be closer to family. You mentioned, uh, man, we were going to take a, a big detour. So <laughs> hold on before we do that. We might need to get some more. Uh, yeah. Let's, uh, let's yeah. do a pause. <clears throat> Give me uh Oh, you can just edit things. That's cool. Yeah, I'll just edit it. <laughs> There's definitely some shit out here. We've reached the uh, intermission portion of the podcast. That's what editing's for. <laughs> we'll get back to you guys in a second. Mm. Not a bad view. Yeah. Boom doing this in sessions all right testing session two <laughs> yeah <clears throat> i think we're going for one of those three hour joe rogan ones. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah get a little sip of that salute salute mm. so uh back from intermission don't know where we were but i know where we're gonna go mm. <clears throat> yeah one of those three hour episodes i think we're probably i don't know hour and a half in no big deal there you go uh, so yeah, plenty of Buffalo Trace. Left, so it's all good. <laughs> yeah. Had a little cigar, had a little trace, collect our thoughts, yeah. took a piss, smoke. Yeah. Um, what did you, yeah. What were you talking about? Upstairs? I had, I had it in my mind and you were talking about being very perceptive. Yeah. Um, how you view the world. So I tend to, this is going to sound strange and I'd like to get your thoughts on this. I, I sit back and I feel like, uh, I'm on the outside looking in. And I, sometimes I text you guys this, but uh, if I'm at the airport, if I'm on the chairlift as a snowboard, uh, snowboarding, uh, if I'm out in public, I observe people and interactions, and I try to analyze and break it down. Why are you doing what you're doing? Why are you saying what you're saying? Uh, and, it, and it almost feels strange in a way. It's almost like I'm analyzing behavior. Mm. Uh, and I think we talked a little bit about that upstairs, like instead of just going through life with your head down, right, facing a feeding trough or whatever it is, being able to to, to have that level of perception and not, I'm by no means an expert at it, um, but questioning. Here's a the quote, question everything. I think that's a little bit loose, mm. but questioning why people do what they do, how they do it. Mm. And back to the whole corporate America thing, that that did not go over well for me there. Mm. I'm like, why are we doing it that way? Mm-hmm. Why are we doing it this way? Why did you do that? That you know what I mean? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And um, <clears throat> I think mm-hmm. it's a good trait. Yeah, I think um, <clears throat> I've had this. I've been thinking about this thing recently. I don't know that I've heard this from anyone else, so it might be someone. I'm sure it stole half of it, but um, so you have iterators and you have innovators. Mm-hmm. Uh, no, I, I didn't come. I, I, I heard this from somewhere, but. Um, Iterators and innovators, and it's important to know which one you are because that that's going to help you. It's kind of like, am I introverted? Am I extroverted? I'm sure mm-hmm. we're all a mix of, of both, right? But um, but knowing kind of your style, that's part of that strategy of seeing yourself and seeing where you are. Um, you know, whenever I said strategy was see where you are, where do you want to go? How do I get there? It's actually pretty hard because mm-hmm. seeing where you are effectively is a, a, a deep level of self-awareness that most people don't have. First of all, because when you really evaluate yourself, you see a lot of shit that you don't like, right? You yeah. see all, all your warts. And so so most people don't really see where they are. But I, I think in your case, um, you know, you have to know, are you an innovator or are you an iterator? The corporate world wants iterators. Entrepreneurs uh, entrepreneurs are, are innovators. Dude, you're an innovator. Mm. So that's why you're always questioning, why are we doing it this way? Um, and and, and c- should we do it another way? I'm an iterator, right? And my mm. staff, the people that work for me will tell you, I'm a hell of an iterator. I'll give you a little bit of guidance. Let me see what you got. And then I'll see what you got. And then it will, it's almost like I have a vision and I'm slowly uncovering my vision. And I uncover that vision by doing multiple iterations of it. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I, I almost need someone else to, I'll give guidance. And then I need someone else to kind of outline that first, almost like chat GPT, right? Like give me the first framework. Mm. And then once I see the framework, then I will iterate it to perfection, right? 
uh, with you as an innovator, um, you don't need, you already have the vision and you're kind of wondering why every process is the way it is anyways. Right. And so Mm. I think you have to have that self-awareness to know that you're an innovator. And that's probably why there's some cognitive dissonance, uh, when you're in the corporate world where they're just looking for iterators and they want you to take something that they've already thought of and make it better. Yeah. With you, you're more like, let's start with something else entirely. Right. And, Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's, you know, so, so I, I think there's something there now. I think, um, Human societies need both, right? We, we, you know, right? If we, if we're optimized at small groups of 140 people, hunter gathering in the middle of the woods, then we need people that have the vision to say, "Hey, we're here, but let's try that valley." And then we need people to say, "We're going to get really good at hunting deer, or we're going to get really good at this," right? And it's the combination of the two that makes society work well. Mm-hmm. Um, and so knowing whether you're an iter- iterator or know whether you're an innovator, I think is going to uh, help you uh, create the narrative in your head of, of how you're, you're interpreting the world. <clears throat> I, you mentioned um, chat G- GPT AI. And I think we're at a, uh, we were actually uh, down in town looking at some pictures from probably the early 1900s. Yeah. And you talked about how those people at, at that time were on the precipice of like greatness, you know, yeah, yeah. planes and auto, uh, automobiles mm-hmm. and trains already been around for a while. And uh, I watched a video about how we're kind of there now. Actually, it was an Elon Musk thing. And he was like, mm-hmm. we're, you know, may you live in uh, interesting times, right? And, yeah. and we are in those times. Yeah, yeah. And I think there's some resistance uh, to AI. I know that you use it. I have used it as a tool. Uh, and it's almost a thing where uh, you, you kind of use it as guidance. Mm-hmm. It's not the, the thing that you actually implement. But I also think when we have mutual friends that, that look at it as, yeah, I, I don't ever think I'll use that, uh, but there's definitely value there. Oh, so uh, I love it. So yeah. I love it because it gives me innovation that I don't have. Mm. So what I do is is I'll put in the prompts <clears throat> and then I'll iterate the prompts or I'll iterate the product. So it's almost like having a creative genie in my pocket that's going to give me my starting place Mm-hmm. And then I will iterate the shit out of that. And, and I'll say, I gave an example earlier today where uh, I was in a, um, a group exercise where we were, you know, the situation was um, a major earthquake hits a medium sized city. Uh, you're the joint task force commander. Um, what are your initial priorities? Man, you know, like, like you can kind of get that like, 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 like deer in the headlights real quick. Mm. Like the whole world's looking at you um, and you have to come up with priorities. You have a staff, you have a task force. They're ready to go. Your first job as a commander is is to develop that vision, right? Is to see where you are and come up with vision. That's the hardest part, I think, about being a commander. So I'll put prompts into Chap GPT and say, "Hey, uh, midsize earthquake. Uh, you know, I'm 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 working with the governor to fix it. What are some things I should be looking at first? And then it will just boom, 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 boom. Right? Uh, communication, search and rescue. Right? Uh, transportation, uh, distribution of of food, points of distribution, uh, water distribution, and and it. Kind Kind of gives me that first thing, that framework of this is the general stuff. And then I almost never go with that, but I'll iterate on it like, ah, oh, yeah, okay, yeah, I'll pull six things from there and then I'll maybe add one or I'll subtract one. And then that becomes the basis, the framework of my thinking. And then I will iterate that all the way through to the vision to, to, to drive forward, right? And so um, where, you know, someone that's more creative maybe doesn't need to do that, but I don't think they'll be able to iterate through it as well as I will, right? And so, again, are you an innovator or are you an iterator? And I think that's important when it comes to, like, building a team or starting a company. Mm. You need to know which one are you. You know, are you the iterator or are you the innovator? You need both on the team to be successful, and, and that, that can help you to build a successful team. <clears throat> Speaking of teams, leading teams, there's an old saying, uh, manager versus leader. Mm. You alluded to being a commander. You know, I, I would assume, you know, a commander at your level is probably equivalent to a CEO of a small company or maybe an executive vice president of a large company. Well, there are a lot of people that the only context they have of the military is I saw Saving Private mm-hmm. Ryan once. Mm-hmm. What's the difference? So, uh, man, you can go deep. There's like 700 books about this. <laughs> uh, but uh, so uh, there, there's a few things. So um, you manage tasks, you lead people. So what, what is leadership? Leadership is motivating folks to do things they normally wouldn't do. What is management? Management is like a logical 
uh, uh, understanding of the tasks and priorities and, and to get it done. And you have to really have both. Mm. Um, but the, the leader is going to provide uh, the mo- – I think it's the motivation. I think a manager can provide direction. Mm-hmm. I think a leader provides direction and motivation. Um, uh, and you know, there's, there's probably some vision there too that, that maybe a manager doesn't have to have the, the vision because they're typically operating within a, a box already. And so the vision's already the vision and direction's already there. Mm-hmm. So they just have to manage the tasks in a logical, scientific way. How do I optimize my resources to achieve a goal? That's management. Leadership is having the vision in the first place, and um, because you're not always, especially in the military, um, right? Where we, we operate a lot of times without 100 percent of the information. Managers almost always have all the information. Mm-hmm. Uh, leaders usually don't. In the best case scenario, you get 80 percent of the information, and you go, and you have to fill in the rest with your vision, and then you have to have to provide motivation to your team. So I, I would say the big difference is is people. You can manage tasks, you can manage programs, you can also manage a team, um, but you can only lead people. Mm. I think, uh, or I know actually, you know, a big phrase or saying we had in the army was tell me what to do, not how to do it. Yeah. So I'm going to give you guidance and then you're going to use your, you know, skill set and your training to achieve a desired uh, goal. Whereas sort of in the corporate sector, what I noticed was tell me what to do and how to do it. Yeah. Like right. You need to do it this way right. to achieve this result. And here, here's right. all the reports that, that, you know, and I think back to, um, you know, Iraq or whatever you could, it's, you could have a second Lieutenant mm-hmm. leading a patrol, <clears throat> you know, this guy's like, or girl, 24 years old mm-hmm. out into hostile territory with limited information. Mm-hmm. Right. And, uh, I think that, you know, that leadership aspect versus, you're a mid-level manager and you're going to do this thing. You're going to do it exactly. And you know what? For everybody out there listening and watching, I don't have any beef with corporate America. I just, <laughs> I just keep yeah, going. You have, a, you have a little beef. I just keep going at, <laughs> back and back. And yeah. Um, but yeah, and, and I guess kudos to the, to the, to the military aspect of that, because yeah, you're putting folks out there, uh, leading in, in hostile or even, it doesn't have to be hostile, very complex environments. Mm. Um, and, and another aspect of that is in the military, Every time you get promoted, you go to a school, you know, three months, six months, whatever it is, to learn how to lead at that level, to yeah. be that yes. rank, yes. right? And, uh, you know, if you're a senior executive at a company, I mean, yeah. obviously you're very well accomplished. Maybe you have an MBA, maybe you don't, yeah. or maybe you've just been really good at this level and then the next yeah. level, then the next yeah. level. Yeah. And I think there's a big distinction that's there. That's unique. So that goes back to that idea of mentorship that we were talking about, right? Mm. And and that's something that, uh, that I think when we were talking about your experience, that I thought that uh, maybe you liked about the military, right? And and the only, not many companies do it. Um, I'll tell you, I was fortunate I worked at GE, and GE actually, you know, they, they took a shot, right? I mean, they, they probably do the best, uh, or, or at least up until the, you know, mid, mid uh, you know, 2010s, they, they were definitely top of the food chain as far as developing leaders. At one point in time, um, the, major, or, uh, the two top producers of CEOs was the United States Army and GE. Hmm. And so GE kind of followed the model uh, that the army does where every level we're going to send you to school. So you understand the buy the book, the buy the book doctrine and you get best practices and we show you what wrong looks like and what right looks like. And then it's on you. Right. Hmm. And so, man, who else does that? You know what I mean? I mean, like, you know, does Amazon do that? I don't know. But like, um, so valuable. So, so valuable. The, the, I, I don't think anyone does developing leaders better than the army. Right. And I'm a fan of the Marines. I'm a fan. Of, I, I love the Navy. The Navy to me is amazing. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I love what the Air Force does. And this is not like taking shots, right? Coast Guard, really cool. Um, but like, no one develops leaders better than the army, right? We start you off as an officer, also on the NCO, right? NCOs have every level of NCO that you hit, you have a school that you go to, right? All mm-hmm. the way through culminating in Sergeant Majors Academy. But on the officer side, we're going to train you for four years before we even commission you, yeah. right? Four years, academics, bachelors, leadership, physical fitness, right? Uh, leadership reaction courses. We're going to throw you in school. We're going to throw you in camps and, and evaluate your leadership and critique it, right? That's just to get started, right? Mm. Then we're going to send you the, the officer basic course uh, to where like you learn how to be a leader in your field. And then we make you a platoon leader 
Then we make you an executive officer over a period of three years. And now you're a captain. Okay, well, now we got to send you to another school. That's the captain's career course because now, now your next key developmental role is a company commander. So we're going to send you to school for almost a year to learn how to be a good company commander. And then you're going to go be a company commander. And then you'll be a staff guy. And then now you're a major. Guess what? We're going to send you to the intermediate leader uh, leadership course, right? ILE. Um, and you're going to learn learn how to, for a year, you're going to, you're going to be in almost like a master's program at Fort Leavenworth, learning how to be a field grade officer. Good job. You did that. Now you went, you were a great battalion XO. Now you did that key developmental role. Great. Uh, now you understand how to manage teams of teams. Now you, now you want to be a Lieutenant Colonel. We're going to send you to war college, two year long, right? Masters. You come out with a master's in strategy, both academics and technical skills, right? I mean, it's like the whole way through. We, we send you to a school and man, that's awesome, right? No one mm-hmm. else does that, right? GE does something similar, but no one invests the time uh, in, in that. And so it, go, it goes back to that mentorship piece, right? And, and, and you're not going to see that. First of all, it's extremely expensive, right? The taxpayer yeah. gets to pay uh, to develop leaders because the country needs good leaders in times of war. So uh, corporations, they, they don't have the excess funds, right? They don't have the overhead to cover that. Um, I mean, you're talking about... Let's see, as an 06, how much schooling have I done? Um, I've done a year. I've done a year. I've done a year. I've done four years or two years, right? So what is that, uh, four or five years, right? Mm. I've done four or five years of leader, just where, just academic leadership training yeah. uh, in a 20, 20, what am I at, 27 years now? And right. 06 is a yeah. full colonel, the big bird, yeah. Yeah. speak to the beak. Speak to the beak. <laughs> Speak to the beak. You know, I heard that until you said it. Actually, <laughs> uh, I um, there's actually a picture hanging on the wall uh, from my infantry officer basic uh, course. Uh, good group of guys, um, and I remember something very specific. And then we're talking about leadership, managing, and all that. Uh, I remember our small group leader. He was a captain. God, I wish I could remember his name. Good dude. Very laid back. His hair was probably a little longer than it should have been. Mm. Um, but he had us in a circle one time, and he was like. Guys, he was like, um, if you get in a firefight, you know, he's talking about I was an infantry platoon leader, and he was like, if you're in a firefight and you are looking through your optic and firing your weapon, you're doing the wrong thing. Who's leading yeah, your men? Yeah. And obviously there are times, uh, but the the point rung home, like who's leading your men? Yeah. Like you're a leader. Like th- there are various levels of that engagement, and and you got to you know delegate and do all the things, and it always stuck with me. Uh, versus. Back to shitting on corporate America. Uh, there was a lot of doers, mm-hmm. doers like mid senior level managers doing. Mm-hmm. Uh, not, and I, th- I think it was because, or I know it was because, like, mm-hmm. how can I control the outcome exactly how I want it to be unless I'm actually doing the thing? Um, I so I'm going to disagree. Oh, perfect. So Let's do it. I I don't disagree about the concept that it is the doers that get promoted in the corporate world, mm-hmm. but I'm going to disagree with why. Okay. So uh, the reason why is because when you're in the corporate world, um, and let's say you're man, let's say you have an engineering team, right? Mm-hmm. Um, who are you going to make your your uh, the right? So you got entry level guys, right? Come in, they're all engineers. They all start at the same time. They're three years into being engineers, right? Okay. All right. Say with aer- aeronautical engineers, right? They're, they're designing parts of an engine. Um, uh, three years passes. Now you need to select one of them to be the leader of the team. Who are you going to select? This is how the corporate world does it. I know what you'll say. You'll you'll say I'll, I'll select the best leader, right? Yeah. Uh, right. Uh, but no, that's not what the corporate world does. They say who's the best engineer? Okay. Uh, this guy, man, he just rocks out parts one after another. This is the guy. He's going to be the leader. Well, it's kind of like Tom Brady versus uh, you know who, who's this uh, long time coach who just retired? Belichick, but, right? Belichick versus Tom Brady, right? You don't want Tom Brady coaching the team. You need Belichick coaching the team. It's a different skill set. The corporate world, because they don't invest in leadership, don't have the ability to effectively pick the, the leaders, and they don't incentivize the leaders because their whole incentive uh, uh, package is based on production. Hmm. But producing individually versus m- making a team produce are two very different skill sets. And so the military, we don't care. Like, okay, this guy might have better PT scores. He's better at this. But people follow this guy. And so as far as a team leader, we're going to take the guy that maybe can't shoot as well, maybe can't run as well. He's good. He could he, he, he can meet the standard and exceed it, but he's not the best of the best. But they follow him, right? There's that. Mm. There's the art of leadership, right? You have the science and art. 
and there's the art of leadership that this person just has. That's the person that we're going to put in the leadership position. The corporate world does not have that capability. And you see it all the way at the top, right? And so the best engineers end up being a VP of something. Um, and they're great doers and they will work themselves to death. They'll work 15 hours and they'll effectively just do all the work that needs to be done and work themselves to death um, mm. versus the person that understands synergy and understands how to take care of people to accomplish a task um, and is not doing things, but is leading other people to do things that the coach, right? Um, and the corporate world is not set up to find that. That's just not, you know, if you're the finance person on Wall Street and you and and, and you produce the best results by, by managing uh, how you're going to invest your resources, right? That's not the person you necessarily want to make the VP because that person is just really good at managing a task, but not managing people. Um, and so I think that's the difference. <clears throat> is there a correlation back to jujitsu? And we're always going to have to interject this. Uh, when you're a leader, you're a colonel or you're a lieutenant colonel, battalion commander, there has to be some level of confidence, but also uh, the whole humble aspect of this. So when you're a brown belt, black belt, you just see whatever it is, I know that personally I'm like, ah, do I deserve this, right? Yeah. But I need to maintain some sort of standard. In your role, uh, do you value that? Uh, instead of walking around with your chest out with a title, that little bit of humble, like, ah, yeah. am I as good as I need to be for my people? Yeah, yeah, so that's humility, uh, and humility is, is is absolutely key. I've been blessed with low self-confidence, right? Mm. Low, low self-confidence and gratitude, I've been blessed with those two things. Man, you're hard to stop when you have a little bit of low self-confidence because with that low self-confidence comes humility. So it's it's built in it's 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 a uh, you know it's built into the system right mm. and so you always have that humility because um yeah i'm not a doer i've never have been a doer i've always been average right uh, yeah. when i worked at ge when i've been in the military yeah i can do stuff and you can do stuff but you know i was always a coach and so i was always the person that can get the most out of a team and so because i know i probably can't do that task i'm having you do better than me when we interact i have humility right i'm not looking down on you I'm puffing you up because I I need you to be successful for me to be successful, mm -hmm. right? I'm not like, what'd you do here? No, this punctuation point is off. And why did you go this route? Blah, blah, blah. No, that's terrible because that's tearing you down and not allowing you to fill your, your potential. So because I know I probably can't do that task as well as you, I think I could probably lead the team better than you can, but I can't do that task as well as you do. So when we interact, I have humility. And, and, and so we are collaborating um, even though I'm your boss, so to speak, or I'm your team lead, we're collaborating because you are better at that than I am. And this person is better at, at what, what she does and he's better at what he does. Mm -hmm. I'm just driving the bus, but you guys are the engine that's making it go. And so that gives you like a sense of humility. And then they're going to buy into that, right? Because humans are, you know, we're geniuses at, at emotional intelligence. And we can see when someone's being, you know, are, are, you, are, you, are you dictating to me or are you collaborating with me? And if they get the sense that you're t collaborating with them, then they're going to buy in and then you're going to get more out of them and then you get that synergy, right? Mm -hmm. And so, um, so I think humility is, is absolutely key. Um, and what happens too with rank is <clears throat> rank is responsibility, right? It's not power. And mm -hmm. once you understand that rank is responsibility, not power, the higher you go, the more, the more humility you'll have because you're like, man, I should, am I the person to, to be, are you sure it's me? You know, it's, right. it's the imposter syndrome, right. That mm -hmm. we talk about when you get promoted in jujitsu, right. Um, you know, it takes years to feel comfortable at a rank in jujitsu because you feel like you're an imposter. Well, that's good. Right. Like yeah. That's awesome because that's going to one, give you humility and two, it's going to let you open your mind to try to improve yourself. Right. Uh, man, the day I get to a rank and I'm like, hell yeah. Like, like I'm that, like, like you got to bow down. Like that's when I'm done. It's over. Right. Mm -hmm. That's the, that's it. Right. So, so as long as you can stay humble, uh, uh, I, I think, yeah, I think that's the trick right there. I think there's an advantage to, and I want to explore this a little bit, being incredibly average. So in school, I yeah. was an average athlete, uh, you know, and I did all the things, football and basketball, and I was an average sort of, you know, maybe a middle top half soldier. Yeah. I was never the fastest or the best or even the smartest. And I think that that pushes, awesome. it awesome. pushes you, right? Yes, it's yes. awesome. It's yeah. like being the second kid. It's a huge <laughs> advantage, huge yeah. advantage, right? So um, I have a very similar story. So uh, I took second in the state in wrestling mm. uh, and division one in Ohio. Now, Ohio's a big, 
big, big state division one's the big school, right? Ohio's probably the, probably the second tough, the second or third toughest high school, um, uh, wrestling in, in the country. And so, uh, so to kind of come from where I came from with no athleticism to get second was a big deal, but what did second make me do? It, it, it made me a little hungry. So mm. when I went to college, okay, so I'm going to go a little harder than everyone else. Cause I took second. I didn't take first. Right. So I go to college. I, I do, I do terrible my first year. I do very well my sophomore year. I was a national alternate. My junior year, I went undefeated. I pinned the number five kid, um, and I ended up hurting my shoulder during the season. And my backup, who was very good, um, overtook me right at the end because I just I lost my right shoulder. Right, I just couldn't move it, and he was good. Um, and so he beat me in the final wrestle off. Right, this is a guy that I had outplaced at tournaments. Right, you know, mm-hmm. and, and he was a great, great, great sparring partner. Um, well, he went to the nationals, and he was an all American. Right. So I missed being an all American because I injured my shoulder. My senior year, we come back. Um, the coach asked me to try to cut down to 197 from heavyweight because now we have an all American heavyweight. So, so our best two wrestlers were each at heavyweight. Right. Mm-hmm. And he cut down from 300 to wrestle two, 285. I walked around about, I wrestled about 270 in that year. So I said, okay, uh, coach, I'll, I'll try to cut down to 197. So then maybe we'll have, you know, two all Americans for the team. I make it all the way down to 199 and I fell the hydration test. Mm-hmm. So now I'm 100. I actually was undefeated that year as well, uh, but I couldn't make it all the way down to 197. Right. So now my backup, he's a two time All American, and I miss being an All American. So then I, I graduate college and I go to co- uh, I go to the military and I start training jujitsu. So now how am I going to train jujitsu? Well, I miss being an All American. So now I want to I want to do really well at jujitsu. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, fast forward to being a brown belt, I wrestle, I, I fight in the worlds, and I miss the bronze medal by referee's call. Um, and so what does that do? That makes you want to keep training. Right. And so you talk about being average. I I think it's a huge advantage never reaching the top of the peak because once you, man, once you get to the top, that's depressing, right? Because like you're at the top and so you, so you don't have the drive to continue to go on. So, you know, there's, there's an idea that being the champion could be detrimental because you're not hungry anymore. Um, and so I've stayed hungry my whole life because I've always missed being the best by one position. Right. Mm-hmm. My entire, you know, so the last, I just fought in the world masters this year. Right. Yeah. I lost, I missed the bronze medal, uh, barely in my, in the quarterfinals match. Right. Barely. I was seated last. I was seated last. I worked my way all the way up to the quarterfinals and I missed the bronze medal, uh, by two points over a guy that I think I could probably beat if I was, if I was, uh, had a little, you know, if I was in a little bit better shape. So what am I going to do now? Guess what? I'm going, I have the discipline now to continue to train Monday, Wednesday, Friday, like, like it's my job, right? So huge advantage in being average, um, mm-hmm. uh, huge advantage. Um, and if you, you know, if we're going to tie this back to the corporate world um, or, or, or to the military, um, you know, being average is great. Uh, you know, how good of a football player was Bill Belichick? I yeah. don't know, right? How, what's the Miami coach? You know, the Miami coach? I love that guy. He's like 160 pounds, yes, right? Yes, I can right? picture his face. Yes, yes. I don't know his name, but like phenomenal. That dude's never playing in the NFL, but he's the coach. Remember, leaders are coaches. They're not doers, mm-hmm. right? And so if you want to be a good leader, you don't have to be – you have to be good, and you, and you have to have the discipline, and you have to set a good example, but you don't have to be the best quarterback to be the best coach, right? Right. D- don't strive to be Brady. Strive to be Belichick, right? Mm-hmm. And so back to your point about being average, like it's an advantage at being average at doing, but how do you lead, Right. That's what it's about. How do you, how do you lead? <clears throat> and I think, uh, yeah, incredible. And, and to be an incredible coach in the NFL, the precedent or, or the you don't have to have been an amazing player in college, an amazing player in the, in the league. And then, OK, now you can be a coach. I mean, yeah. that has happened. Yeah. Uh, I think back in back to the corporate sector, sometimes they believe if you haven't worked your way up from the entry level to the mid to the whatever, whatever, then how could you possibly be a senior Mm-hmm. Uh, a senior leader, an effective senior yeah, leader. Yeah. So, I, and I think what you do there is there is value uh, to ec- to domain expertise at different levels. Mm-hmm. The trick is, is are you doing or are you leading? So I would say you want to be a manager of a team as quickly as possible, right? The military is phenomenal at this uh, mm-hmm. because they make you a team leader by the time you're like an E4. Yeah. So if you think about all your military jobs, outside of being a staff officer, uh, especially on the NCO ranks, you're always a man. You're always a team leader. Always. Right? Mm-hmm. There, I mean, always. And so you're a team leader. Then you're a squad leader. Then you're a platoon sergeant. Then you're a first sergeant. Then you're a sergeant major. Right. Yep. So you have to be a doer just good enough to make it to the first team. 
And then mm-hmm. once you once you get to that first team, now it's not so much about you being able to do. It's about your ability to lead. So what I, my, my recommendation to folks diving into the corporate world is get to a leadership position as quickly as possible, right? Mm-hmm. If it, so this entry level, try to become the leader of the entry level as quickly as you can and then stay in the leadership realm because that's that's where the big money is and that's where the big responsibility is. And what's the, you know, we've talked about this at length over over the years, the concept of leading a team of teams, mm-hmm. right? So you know, whatever your span of control is, 10 folks, 15, whatever it is. Yeah. But it's an art, right? It's a, it's a, yeah. it's a required skill. Yeah, that's tough, man. Yeah, that's a different thing. And, and in the military, that happens at about your fill grade level, right? Because company grade officers are second lieutenants, first lieutenants, captains. Your culminating job as a captain, as a company commander, but really... You're, you're still kind of the direct leader, right? You have platoons, but you're really leading the platoon leaders. And so um, your first time where you're responsible for leading teams of teams are when you're a field grade officer, and it's typically when you become a major. Um, and, and teams of teams are, are, are different, but I got to tell you, it's kind of the same. Because the team of teams, it, you're still leading the team leader of that team, mm-hmm. right? And so I would say that um, it's kind of the same. It's it's It's... You need a little bit more patience, and and you need to see the bigger picture. That's the that's the difference because you need to understand how this team's performance impacts another team's performance, which overall impacts your process. But as far as like who you're interacting with, you're still just interacting with the, the team leader, right? The platoon leader doesn't manage the alpha team leader of of the first squad. The platoon leader manages the squad leader, right? Mm-hmm. Me as a brigade commander, I manage battalion commanders. And so, so I see how they're doing, but really my, my, my direct reports are, are still the battalion commanders. And so it's similar, it, um, but now I understand that that person has a large team that they lead. So I have to have more, more patience with that person, right? And I have to trust, trust. Yeah, you've kind of helped me distill it down. It comes down to trust. When you're managing a team of teams, I, I, am, I am forced to trust you more. Because yes. you now are a battalion commander and you have your own staff and you have, right, and you have all your companies and you have your sergeant major and kind of your own vibe. So I have to trust you. Uh, uh, that's the difference, I would say. <clears throat> so for those that aren't familiar, uh, being a battalion commander, you could have up to what, about a thousand folks? Yeah, I have one of my battalions is a thousand. Yep. Yeah, you're a lieutenant colonel uh, in the army and you have, you know, pretty large organization within your span right. of control. So when we talk about leading at that level and we talk about you as a brigade commander in charge of those battalion commanders and we've done all the things we talked about team of teams and we talked about leadership versus management we've talked about um trust when you look at how many battalion commanders do you have uh, right now two um and i'm the rear, rear d brigade commander right now and uh, with a little luck i'll be taking over the brigade sometime this summer and so at that point i'll have three battalions okay so when you have three maybe you have four what sets apart so when you're talking about uh, if I'm a junior manager and I have like, you know, uh, people that have four people, you mm-hmm. know, versus I have four battalion commanders and each of them have a thousand folks, mm-hmm. what sets apart one from the other in your mind when you're rating them, mm-hmm. right? When you're like, okay, this guy or yeah. this girl is better because of, and maybe it's the metrics or maybe yeah. is it something else? Honestly, it, 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 there's there's a lot of performance and culture. So, mm-hmm. um yeah, I guess two things, uh, if I had to distill it down. First is the culture, right? So our, uh, what is the culture of your organization? Hmm. So I'm trusting you. Do you trust your subordinates? Do your subordinates feel safe and empowered? Do your, do your subordinates, um, are you getting the most out of your subordinates? What's the culture like? Um, and then the second one is just straight production, right? Hmm. Like, like are, you, are you hitting the metrics, right? It's kind of like Belichick has to win games, right? Yeah. The ultimate metric of Belichick uh, is is winning games, and if I'm the owner, right, which means I'm now managing Belichick, are you winning or you're not? And then, so do you have a good culture? Are guys getting DUIs and you know parties and drug charges and shooting people? That's an aspect of it. The other aspect of it is, are you winning? I want you to do good at both. Mm. And uh, and so that those are the two big two big things. So you can have a great culture, but if you can't get anything done, then it's like oh, okay. Uh, but but if you get all kinds of stuff done, but you have a terrible culture, then you know you're going to wear that organization out and leave it worse for the next person. Let's go to the other other end of the spectrum. You meet somebody, maybe they're a commander for you, maybe they're not. What uh, insight when you interact with folks? 
what do you immediately notice that's a red flag? Mm. What do you immediately notice about somebody? Maybe it's their character. Yeah. Uh, the first one is going to be humility because mm. you could tell. You know what it's like when you talk to an asshole. And, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah. oh, geez, really, this person's full of themselves. If they're too self-focused, <clears throat> then then I, a good leader, especially in the military, is focused down on their organization and focused up and out. Mm-hmm. So are your focuses in the right spot? And I can tell that by just having a conversation with you. Or are you self-centered? Mm. If you're self-centered and, and competitive, then that means that, one, you're not going to work well with your peers, and I need you to work well with your peers because we're all the same team, offensive line, quarterback, running back, right? I can't have the offensive line just in it for themselves, right? I need you all to work well. Um, uh, are, you know, are you looking at the bigger picture up and out, and are you taking care of your people? And I can, And if you're not humble and you're self-centered as we're talking, that's it. It's over. That's not a person I want on my team because I know that they're not going to be able to manage their people effectively, work well with their peers, and they're not they're not going to have the um, vision to look up and out, right? Mm. Um, because they're they're you almost shouldn't be focused on yourself at all, right? Like you're you're ag- you're self agnostic, right? I don't care mm-hmm. where I go, what happens to me, whatever. I got my team. I got my peers that I'm, I'm teammates with, and I got the larger vision that my bosses want me to do. There's no room for you. Right. Mm. There's no room for you. Uh, you. You are you are not there. Right. Um, and, you know, you have to take care of yourself physically and mentally and do the things to make sure you perform almost like it's a sport. But that's it. You're not there. And so if I meet you and you're all about you. Yeah, it's not the guy or, or the gal. How do you. Um, I don't know if you've ever been in this position. I, I've been in the position on, on the lower half of this spectrum. I would have to imagine as a brigade commander it would be a very difficult position. So maybe you do have that leader and they're not good, Mm. Um, but you cannot undermine them Mm -hmm. to the folks that are within their span of control. And and you know, they're not good. And you know that the the, the folks are trying to be, you know what I mean? So you're in this weird position of like, this guy fucking sucks or girl. Yes. But I can't stand on a stump and be like, I can't do that out in in public. Right. So yeah. Yeah. How do you deal with that? Yeah. So it's actually not that hard. So um, yeah. Yeah. Um, It's, it's, not hard to do logically. It's hard to do emotionally. Mm. So, um, so first, I'm going to try to mentor you because my job is to take care of those that do the work, right? That's effectively my job. So, if you, let's say you're my subordinate, let's say you're a battalion commander, and you're struggling, my first job is to mentor you because mm-hmm. I'm a coach too, right? Mm-hmm. I'm Belichick, right? You, you're Brady, even though you are a coach to your team, you're a player on my team, right? Mm-hmm. And so I'm going to mentor you first. As long as you don't do something illegal, immoral, right, uh, I, I, I could still work with you, right, for mm-hmm. a little while anyways. Um, and so that, that that that's the first step is I'm, I'm literally coaching you almost like you're a lieutenant, like, hey, uh, what's going on? Let's talk. You know, why'd you do this? Why'd you do that? How could you have done that better? Okay, what, what are you struggling with? Okay, hey, are, are you not clear with my 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 guidance and my intent? Um, a lot of times I'll give that person more guidance than I will anyone else. I'll, I'll do side calls with them. Like I'll right. put out guidance in a meeting and then I'll say, hey, Phil, uh, you tracking what I mean? Yeah. All right, tell me what I meant, right? No, okay, no, no, that's not what I meant. This is what I meant, right? Mm-hmm. And so, so you, you have that mentoring responsibility to that person. Um, and then if that doesn't work, then you got to go into the kind of negative counselings, right? So in the Army, we have this kind of escalation of force where it's first I'm going ver- to mentor you, then I'm going to verbally counsel you on, hey, dude, you're messing up. Then I'm going to written counsel you. And then after that, I'm just going to fire you, mm-hmm. right? And so, um, uh, or I can rehabilitatively transfer you. So if it takes mm. you two years to be a successful battalion commander, you might get transferred uh, at a year because you're just not getting it done, right? Mm-hmm. Nice guy, you know, heart's in the right spot, just not getting it done. And, you know, it's kind of like the NFL, right? I mean, if you're not a good quarterback, they're ruthless, right? Like, okay, <laughs> yeah. bro, like I tried, uh, time time for, for someone else. Yeah. Um, and I say that, but really, you really have to take responsibility for training the person first, right? And so I, and I take it personally. And quite frankly, I don't have many people that fell uh, that, that are direct reports to me because I invest so much time into them. Like I will make mm. you successful, right? I will hold your hand and make you successful um, at least until you've kind of met the bare minimums. And, th- and then I'll move you out and say, hey, you know, leadership, maybe isn't your task. Maybe you want to be a staff officer. Maybe you want to be a doer, right? So Mm -hmm. in the military, we have this command staff dichotomy. um, And that is leaders tend to be in command positions. Doers tend to be in staff positions. Both both are extremely important to the team. Um, We tend to promote and value command leadership 
better. Uh, but if you're a doer, um, you're going to add a lot of value to the fight. So I could put you in an 05 doer position and have you be a phenomenal staff officer, right? But you got to be good at one of them. Yeah. Right? You can't be bad at both. So <clears throat> I kind of want to pivot. So, uh, and maybe we'll wrap it up with this. We, we've talked a lot about sports. Uh, you know, I always get analogies and metaphors mixed up. Uh, but, you know, blocking and tackling Tom Brady, mm -hmm. Bill Belichick, <laughs> you know, you're a Columbus, Ohio guy. Yeah. Big sports guy, big Ohio State guy. Obviously, you went to Ohio State. Uh, I just have – what is going on with uh, the uh, uh, literal obsession uh, – Ohio State Buckeyes, mm. Ohio State, Michigan. Like my brother-in-law won't even mm -hmm. say Michigan. Wow, uh, that's a lot. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and uh, I've I've always and the reason I bring this up is yeah. I always found that found that absolutely fascinating. It's it's one thing to yeah. be a fan, yeah. like yeah, follow sports. It's another yeah. thing to be totally consumed. Yeah, and I think you know it's a great thing. I think uh, you know pride for your city, pride for your team, um, but it's how, de it's deeper than that though. It's deeper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's it's tribal. Interesting. Sports are nothing more than a manifestation of, of tribalism. It's all it is. Mm. And so, um, right, so geography is typically correlated with culture. So I'm from Columbus, Ohio. I want my Ohio culture to produce better teams and products and football players than your Michigan culture, which is uh, historically spoke a different language and dressed a different way and painted their face a different way and had different customs, right? And so it, so it is literally a manifestation of, are we living life better than you? Hmm. Now, that's why I don't like NFL, because NFL is not a good, uh, it's, it's not a good ambassador for the success of your regional culture, because everyone's basically a mercenary, right? Because Tom Brady didn't grow up in Boston, right? Right. You're right. And so um, now you can argue that that college football is no longer that 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 good of an ambassador, especially at Ohio State, where they they recruit nationally. I really love the Ohio kids that are playing on the team uh, because I know what high school that person went to, and maybe I knew their father, right? And and so so they are a representation of my tribe. So I want my tribe to be better than your tribe, so that I know that we are doing things right. And, uh, and that is why I think that the college football stadiums are bigger than the NFL stadiums because it's more tribal. It's also way more regional. And mm -hmm. so, um, and so when you, and that's, so whenever Michigan beats Ohio state, it's like, what, what like, what are we doing wrong in Ohio? You know what I mean? Right. Like, am I disciplining my kid enough? Are our schools good enough? Is there a weather deal? You know, what's going on? Do we have the right politicians? Do we have the right, 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 right? It <laughs> is it is a deep thing. But I think all sports are like that. You go to Europe, soccer, yeah, same, same yeah. way, right? And, and, and the more closely correlated the players are to the culture, uh, the more fanaticism you're going to have, right? You can mm. watch rugby. You can watch, you know, I mean, Europe's a great example um, where like the cities will have their own city teams. And man, it is bloodthirsty. I mean, they will, they will fight to the death. <clears throat> so that that's that's where it's from that that that's what it is um you know uh you know how sometimes it gets shit on but like guess what like california like let's play some football <laughs> let's see who's producing better humans right mm -hmm. oh it looks mm -hmm. like we are you know what i mean and uh, it, it, and, and maybe football is a bad metric but but that's the source right that's that's what drives that fanaticism i think what is your opinion on you know we're here in colorado uh massive Coach Prime phenomenon, mm -hmm. monster. I mean, this guy basically came in, loved Dion, took over mm -hmm. the state, mm -hmm. uh, and you know the team did okay in the beginning, didn't do okay in the end. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What What's your thoughts on that? So I, I tell you, um, what do they say? It's It's not whether you want to lose; it's how you play the game. Mm -hmm. So what you want out of your coaches is is you want them coaching in a way that's sustainable, that's showing the players how to win at life. Mm. And so if you look at American sports over the last 40 to 50 years, we've kind of gone from sportsmanship. Um, hey, I'm going to beat you, but I'm going to act like I've been here before. Hey, I just scored. I'm not bringing attention to myself because I'm a part of a team. Right. right. And, and, and so, we, um, so we've kind of lost a little bit of that. So, so I think what, 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 Deion Sanders rep represents. He represents the, hey, flash, look at me, uh, self-centered uh, entitlement 
Um, and, and, a, and I think a lot of Americans have bought into that, right? Um, you know, it's, it, everyone's kind of entitled now. And so there's a part of America that wants to see someone with the flash, the prime time, hey, look at me. They want to see them be successful because I think it validates their, 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 uh, their, their operating mode, right? Mm. Um, but then there's another part of America that wants to see that fail because they know that that's not the way to win in life, right? You, that's like being selfish is not going to allow you to be a good team member, not going to allow you to be a good member of the tribe. So you don't want to see a football team like that be successful because it's actually bad for society. And so I think that that's the dichotomy. And mm. that's why that someone like uh, Deion Sanders and, and coming to Colorado gets so much attention, right? Because it's, hey, am I, is it okay to be selfish or... Um, is it is it better to 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 be a good teammate, right? And so watching that clash is going to be very interesting. Now, Coach uh, Deion Sanders has been very successful at, at the at the lower levels, um, mm-hmm. you know, and maybe he actually is a team guy, right? And that's that's the interesting thing is that I don't actually think he's a selfish coach per se, and I don't know that he he espouses those values, but that's the perception. Right. And so it's going to be interesting to see what happens. Um, but I think I think that's why it's it's a it's a dichotomy. It's kind of us versus them. And, and I think that's what's going on. And the truth is, is he, uh, he won a couple games, but he, he has a lot to prove um, uh, to say, you know, whether he's a s- successful coach or not. Well, he certainly did. Uh, certainly did create a lot of hype. Yeah. I'm sure he brought in some dollars and he's an electrifying personalities all over. Yeah. You know, commercials and stuff. I tell you, man, um, that's a dangerous thing, right? So it, it, it's it's dangerous to idolize someone that brings a lot of attention to themselves. Mm. This is why it's dangerous. Deion Sanders is a phenomenal athlete, probably one of the top 10 athletes of the last century. I mean, you know, uh, right, amazing ba- basketball player, amazing baseball player, right? He can do anything, right? Yeah. But that, like, bring attention to myself prime time, doesn't work for the average person. And so there's a lot of damage that someone can do whenever you say, hey, this is the way the game should be played. Sure, you're the 0.00001%. You can do whatever you want, but you're just going to be better than everyone else. Mm. Society will suffer if they follow your lead and say, I have to be selfish and I have to bring attention to myself and screw everyone else and I'm the best. If, If you have society trying to emulate that, it's not sustainable. So there's, there's that, that, that's a, you know, that's a, t- that's why people, you know, don't like, you know, uh, you know, prime time in the eighties and nineties, because they, they, they sense that deep down that like, Hey, you're a phenomenal gifted athlete and you work very hard, but, but have a little humility, right? Mm. Have a little humility. Did you, uh, by any chance watch the documentaries a couple years ago on Bo Jackson? No, but I'm familiar with Bo Jackson's story. Yeah. And, and, and there was a scene in this, um, in his documentary where he's like sharpening an arrow or something. Mm-hmm. That's his thing, archery. Mm-hmm. And uh, they were like, where are all your trophies? He's like, it's like in boxes in the basement. Like, right, right. Just doesn't even, uh, I don't say he doesn't care. I can't speak for him, but just, yeah. it's like, that was a part of my life. And I like to shoot arrows now. Yeah. Like it's not yeah. even a thing. Yeah. Right. And, and that's the right answer. And that's, and that's what I think is better for society, right? Mm. What's better for society. Be a good teammate, have people like you be agreeable, work well, in a team because humans, humanity is a team sport. Mm. It's not an individual sport. And so I think the example, right, you could argue Bo Jackson was, was the best athlete of the last century, yeah. if not at least the second best. Um, and Who was the best if he's not? Uh, uh, what's the guy uh, from the 30s? Um, oh, man, uh, Thornton? No. Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, Carlisle. I played for Carlisle uh, Indian School. Don't know. Oh, man, he won like... He won like Olympic gold medals wearing uh, wearing like different colored shoes, right? like a uh, um, Native American guy, Jim Thorpe. Jim okay. Thorpe. Yeah, okay. yeah. So right, I mean, so like Olympic gold medalists and like NFL, uh, you know, All American, right? And mm-hmm. like you know, just just phenomenal athlete. Actually, I worked out at the Jim Thorpe gym when I was at Carlisle Barracks. Oh man, awesome! Just like they had a statue out there. I would like run on the field where he played football. Just oh, wow, oh, the dude was a stud. But anyways, him or, or Bo Jackson, whatever, like, like, like those, those guys are so close, it's hard to argue. But um, but like that attitude of like, I'm selfless, I'm humble, I'm a good teammate. Yes, I am also the best, but if I go up there and brag that I'm the best, then the worst thing in the world is for a little kid to emulate that, 
because mm. that kid's not going to be the 0.0001%. What that kid needs to learn in the game of life is how to be a good teammate and how to integrate into the tribe and add value. That's what that kid needs. He doesn't need to be like, hey, look at me. I'm the best, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to win badly. No, no, that's not what they need. So someone like Bo Jackson who's setting that example – that's the guy that America wants to see win, right? Those mm. are the people that, that that get the most adoration and the most props. I like that, especially in a world of, uh, you know, I guess Conor McGregor and Khabib come to mind. Yes, yes. Great examples. And Khabib of- crushed him, <laughs> crushed him, and it wasn't even close. And Khabib models what right looks like Yeah. versus Conor, who is going to make individual money, but how many people have been knocked out acting like Conor McGregor? How much damage to society has Conor McGregor caused because people looked up, to, looked up to him and thought, I should be like that? Sure, it's great for Conor McGregor. It's great for Muhammad Ali, legendary athletes. But look, if you, if you were to weigh in the positives versus the negatives of their impact to society over a long period of time, mm. I think it's a net loss because people think they have to They have to turn the attention on themselves. They have to win badly. They have to talk crap. Those people aren't going to be successful in life because they don't have the talent that Muhammad Ali does. They don't have the left hand that Conor McGregor has. So when you act like that in the aggregate of society, it's bad. It's not good, even though that person might be successful. Well, you mentioned it, and I think uh, let's take football, for example, because you don't have eight-year-old kids uh, in the octagon. but (laughs) Not yet. Not yet. (laughs) yet. But you got, you know... uh, eight-year-old kids with uh, you know the visor and all the swag and you know yeah. my brother uh my brother and his best friend his best friend played uh, actually have some of his memorabilia over there play for the white Sox. my brother played college ball mm-hmm. and they call it eyewash mm-hmm. so it's like just all this swag and you know, all the stuff you got going mm-hmm. on and and you know so these kids see the mcgregors or they see the Dion's and they see and they're like i said eight years old and they're doing all the things mm-hmm. and they're celebrating and all about me mm-hmm. uh yeah i don't know how good that is so i would argue that that Look at our prison rates right now, right? I mean, mm-hmm. look at the amount of crime. Look at look at the uh, inequality that's growing in our in our culture from from haves that basically do the right thing and have nots that have been influenced by people to not do the right thing, right? It's growing exponentially, right? So, I would argue that, that it's it's absolutely uh, bad for society. Yeah, act like you've been there. Yes, and and have be humble and be a good teammate. If you can, man, if you take the best athletes and they they set that example, they're now they're now transcending their sport because mm. the value that they're adding to the society um, is way more than the money that they've earned as, as an athlete. Mm. And, I, and I think, you know, it's good to tie this off with uh, talking about being humble because uh, through this interaction, I've, I've talked a lot of shit about corporate America, but <laughs> the interesting part about that is, is I struggled uh, with being humble during my time there because I was always a, uh, uh, you know, a metrics, like I'm on the top of the food chain, I'm doing mm-hmm. this, I'm doing this. And interestingly enough, you know, that's when I, I struggled the most with, mm-hmm. um, you know, my pride and, 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 and feeling fulfilled, letting go of that, coming to a position where, you know, I don't know everything. I'm mm-hmm. very mediocre. I'm trying mm-hmm. to learn. And it's almost like the scale slides to the other way mm-hmm. where you're like, man, I, I have people telling me that I inspire them. And it's mm-hmm. like, I'm not trying to do that. Yeah. Uh, you're humble now. Right. Right. Yeah. And you can't fake that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now I would say um, you could also achieve that in the corporate world. It's all about how you look at it. Marcus Aurelius, right? Marcus Aurelius mm-hmm. said, mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I don't know the exact quote, but but he, he would say, hold yourself to a higher standard, expect other people to mess up. Mm. And when they mess up, you have to forgive them. Mm-hmm. You still hold yourself to a higher standard. I think what you were doing a little bit and what we what people tend to do, myself included, is you think, well, I wouldn't do that. Like, what are these people doing? Like, God, oh, these idiots. Like, come on, right? Mm. You have to find a way to be like, he's just a human. Uh, he's he's doing his best. He wants to do well. Yep. He doesn't see the error of his ways, and that's okay, but I'm still going to hold myself to a higher standard. Mm-hmm. And that's hard. That's hard to do. It's hard to do, and it's hard to uh, relearn midlife. Yeah. yeah. You know, when, you, when yeah. you're in your 40s, and you're like, I got it all figured out. I'm going to do it this way, and nobody can tell me anything, and... Man, that's incredibly tough. I don't know. Yeah, I think you're right. But man, uh, as I've gotten older, I think that uh, that if you just, I think that learning, they always say that learning isn't easier when you get older or mm. it gets harder. I don't know if that's true, man. I, I feel like if you have an open mind, yeah, 
and I know you experienced this, I experienced this, but like I'm way smarter now than I was when I was 30. And my ability to learn something is way better than it was when I was in my 30s and my 20s. I'm sure there's a point at which it will stop. But I think if you try to have an active learning mindset, um, uh, whether it's forced or not forced, um, I think that's the way to continue to evolve. And that's what you're doing, right? I mean, you're, mm-hmm. you're, you become an expert in something that you knew nothing about a year ago. Um, and it's made you better in other things. It's, it's, it's taught you how to learn. Mm. Uh, we were talking about this a little bit earlier um, off camera about, um, about getting really good at one thing enables you to get good at a lot of things, right? Mm. And so for me, first it was wrestling. And then I got good at jujitsu, kind of good. Uh, and then I'm kind of good at the military um, and, uh, and I f- kind of good, right. It's hard to say you're good at something, right. <laughs> right. But, but, um, but I've kind of learned the game a little bit, um, I'm at least average. And so, um, but it's the same thing, right. It's the thing, the thing that got me good at wrestling was the thing that got me kind of good at jujitsu, which I also used to get good at, at kind of the army. And then I also used to get good at kind of when I was at GE in the corporate world. So it's like the act of getting good at something is a skill, Mm. And once you learn that skill, you can apply it to, to wh- whatever you're doing, right? And so, and I think that's what, what you're doing, right? You got, you got good at the military, you're extremely entrepreneurial, um, and now you're taking that same skill set of how do I acquire skills and master something, and now you're mastering this. And that's awesome. And that's what's going to keep you young. Yeah. And then if you do that until you're 90, you're going to be a healthy, happy 90-year-old. If you stop learning when you're 40, you're dead at 60, Mm. I think that's the game. It's, um, that's epic. I think, where do I, oh man, because you got two things in one there. I think learning, it's more than just rise and grind. It's more than just I get, wake up at four, get in my ice bath, and I grind all day. That's just, mm-hmm. you know, people, it's very kind of in the culture now. Mm-hmm. I think it's a innate, like a, an extreme desire to, and I have it hanging on my door, you might have saw it, but every day, win every day, be better today than the next day than the next day. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't have to do specifically with working hard, mm-hmm. right? Like it's it's a little more than that, a little less than that. Uh, I think it's just, and when I try to pin down like what got me here, full studio, having you in here, mm-hmm. it wasn't because I worked hard. Uh, I mean, I, I, I put in a lot of hours and all that, but I think it more than anything an extreme desire and a passion to pursue something with no defined end state. <clears throat> like I'm going down this path and it's going to happen or it's not going to, ha- it's going to happen. <laughs> and, and it's, it's hard to, and I'm struggling to explain that um, right, because I, I want to dispel the, 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 the misconceptions. I was like, Oh, you just got to work harder. Just work yeah. harder. Just work yeah. harder. It's not that, you know, yeah. I mean, there's hard yeah. work involved, but there's a little more than that. I would argue it's consistency. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's kind of burn the bridge or burn the boats a little bit, but it's consistency. Right? I think, uh, there's, a, there's another saying, uh, put your, put your uh, ass where your heart is. Mm. That's what you're doing. Yeah. You put, you know, you, you, you know, you know where, where you want to go. Kind of, you have a passion and, and you're putting in the work to get it done. And so mm. maybe I think you are working hard. I just don't think that it feels like work because, yeah. because you're framing it in a positive way. You're, you're intentional about it. And so you're kind of flowing through it vice Vice grinding like you would at the corporate world, because mm. because you put in some hours, man. Well, if you put it like that, I mean, if you look at the microphones we're using, I've probably watched fifteen hours of video studying, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. and like research and all. Just like, mm-hmm. oh, this is the microphone I want. Yeah, so it is a little bit of that. Um, yeah. You did mention, and we'll tie this off. We'll wrap it up with this something deep. Uh, you know, you talked about, and you'll live till ninety, yeah, uh, or you'll live till sixty. Yep. I think people are afraid of or don't want to talk about our own mortality. Yeah. And I think if you look at us, we're both 46 years old. I'm wearing the 1977 amazing Star Wars shirt. It is an amazing shirt. Yeah, and we got Jealous. Amazon vintage Star yeah. Wars. <laughs> um, I saw a quote once that said, we stupid humans think we'll live forever. Yeah. Uh, and if you, sit, if you sit here and you put it in a box and you're like, I'm 46, you're 46. At best... You and I have four decades, probably good decades, maybe probably, three, probably, probably three, yeah, two, maybe three, three yeah. right? Maybe three. And if, and, and so let's just say it's three. And I think about, well, what was three decades ago for me? I remember it. And it's like, boom. And you don't have to get too deep or anything, but it's just like, mm-hmm. you've only got a certain block left Yeah. and, and usable block where you're effective. 
Yeah. And I think that people put that off and they, ah, no, net, 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 later, later, later. Yeah. And it's like, look, dude, the clock's ticking. Tick tock. That's right. And you got to do the best you can uh, with what you have and, and acknowledge that this is happening. No matter what you're doing, this is happening. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So uh, there's a quote, uh, I don't know who says it, but it's, it's something to the effect of, um, you have two lives. Uh, uh, you have uh, you, uh, the, you have two lives. The first, you start out in the first life, and then the second life starts when you realize you only have one. Mm, right? That's deep. Yeah, and and so like like yeah, you have to know that you you, know, you have to keep that. that. That's another stoic principle. But like, you know, you know that you're going to die every day. Living is an act of dying. Mm. And and if you keep that in mind, then it enables you, it gives you the motivation to go out there and do stuff, right? So uh, Marcus Aurelius, uh, I, I, I love that guy. I've, re I've read his book twice. Um, great quote. The guy's like at the end of his life, right? He's the he's the most powerful man in the world, mm. right? Right at the end of his life, um, right? I mean, like I, I don't think we have anyone today that had the power that a Roman emperor had, especially when Marcus Aurelius was the Roman Empire. That was probably at the height of the Roman Empire. There's no one today that has that power, right? Mm. So, so we can't even really acknowledge what it was like. But uh, someone saw him, right? Guy's like sixty something years old. Uh, some, he, he's leaving the leaving the castle or, or leaving leaving his his house, and he has a has a carrying a, a pile of books. And someone's like, "Hey, uh, well, sir, where are you going?" He's like, "Oh, I'm going to go learn from this philosopher." They're like, "Why? Why? Because I don't know it yet, <laughs> right?" Yeah. Like, wow. Okay. Like, okay. Well, you know, like if that dude's doing it, mm. then maybe I should do it. <laughs> yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? And so it kind of goes, it ties both of them back together. One, you're going to die, but two, never stop learning. Because as long as you're learning and improving, you're, 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 you're living, you know? Mm. And uh, you said something earlier about trying to constantly get better. Uh, Jigoro uh, Kano, the guy that um, invented um, judo, where jujitsu came from, right? Mm. He was Count Maeda's instructor. Um, he had a, he had a saying that, um, your goal is to be better than you were yesterday. That's it. That's mm. it. That's it. That's, that's, that's it. That's if you, you can, that's, that could be the mechanism of the escalator that you ride through life. Just be better than yesterday. That's the only thing you need to live by. Mm. You don't really need anything else. And so, and it, I think it was interesting that it came from a, you know, renowned martial artist. But. And that's why I have, uh, I, you know, win the day on my, on my door. Cause it's yeah. like, if you compartmentalize and say, what are you going to do today? What are you going to do today? And then whatever it is I do, I ask myself that question. Okay, was that your best effort? Yeah. If that wasn't your best effort, then you need to do it again tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. And it's an incredible way to look at things, and it's something that I wish I'd discovered earlier in life. Yeah. Uh, but I didn't. I think that allows us to be hopefully the best version of ourselves, even if that means being an incredibly average version of ourselves. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that's tough, man. And, you know, we were talking about um, – ourselves when we were, you know, 21, 22 young privates in the military. Mm. And it's like, God, I wish I could go back and talk to that guy. Oh my like, God. Dude, I'm you from the future. <laughs> you can believe what I'm saying. Um, try harder. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? Like, like do it. You know what I mean? Like do mm. it now. Don't wait. Like, 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 don't, you know, don't, don't feel bad. Don't feel like the world's against you. Don't feel like uh, you hate your bosses because you got to go and do PT. Just do it hard, man. Yeah. yeah. Justin, our friend, mutual friend, Justin sent us that, uh, I think it was the Ed Milet show. He had an episode, The Power of Now. Mm. And he was yeah, like, yeah. just, dude, don't think about it. Do it. Right. Right. You, it just do it. Like, there are a million reasons, maybe not a million, why I shouldn't have bought that and shouldn't have bought that and, like, wait, yeah. have more capital and do this and this. And it's like, no, just do it. Yeah. Like, it's going to work out. Yeah, I think you have to believe it's going to work out. Right. Like, if you look back on uh, me, like, the last 20 years and all the times where I laid awake at night, I'm like, it's not going to work. It's not going to work. Here I sit. Yep. <laughs> and it's and it's always worked out. Yeah. And I think there's something special to that. Yep. Well, uh, we have had an incredible, I think we're pushing two hours. I don't know. Nice. I feel like it's longer than that. Yeah, I think it's maybe two yeah. and a half hours. Uh, yeah. I'll have to do this, split this into segments. But uh yeah, we smoked about three batteries on this thing. There you go. And and two cigars. <laughs> <laughs> and two cigars. Well, uh, I want to thank you for coming out, being on this show. Uh, rebranded from the Moto Beamer show because it was specifically catered to motorcycles. The Phil experience now is like, I want to do motorcycles, but I want to have conversations like this. Okay. Uh, that will yeah. live on and on and, uh, you know, hopefully be a good message to folks. So, Colonel, how long until General? Uh, 
a couple years. Yeah, well, we'll see. <laughs> Just trying to be a good colonel. <laughs> yeah, yeah, trying to be a good colonel. Brandon Tackett, one of the smartest and most articulate guys I know. Thank you for coming on the show and doing me the service and everybody else who's listening to this. Hey, thanks for having me, man. This is awesome. I felt, and I got to end with this, I felt uh, incredibly, what's the word I was looking for? Um, almost at a disadvantage. Uh, just because of, you know, your knowledge and, you know, all the things you've learned about and done. But I feel like it's been an incredibly um, great conversation. Well, I appreciate the compliments. Not sure they're all true, but it's all good, brother. <laughs> all right. All right, man. All right. We'll do it again soon. Yep. Thanks, everybody.